It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat's here. Richard Campbell's traveling, although he may make a surprise visit <laughs> at the airport. There is, uh, as you might imagine, if you've been following the news, a bit to talk about. Panos Panay abruptly leaves Microsoft. Where is he headed next? And was he pushed or did he jump? Also, we'll talk about the leaked memo and the hundreds of pages of revelations about the Xbox roadmap. Paul's got all the details for that. And then a preview of tomorrow's, what we were calling it a Surface event. Paul says it's not about Surface. All that coming up next on Windows Weekly. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Thorat, episode 847. Recorded Wednesday, September 20th, 2023. Jushed. This episode of Windows Weekly is brought to you by Nureva. It's a first. Nureva's new Pro Series, the HDL310 for large rooms and the HDL410 for extra large rooms, gives you uncompromised audio in systems that are incredibly simple to set up, manage, and deploy at scale. Learn more at Nureva.com slash twits. And by Miro. Miro is your team's online workspace to connect, collaborate, and create together. Tap into a way to map processes, systems, and plans with the whole team. Get your first three boards for free to start creating your best work yet at Miro.com slash podcast. It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Thorat is here. Richard Campbell is uh, en route to where? New Zealand, Paul? Is he, uh, is he New in Zealand New Zealand? Or... We don't know or Australia. I think I think he's going to. Why don't I know this? We don't know. <laughs> it's one of the. We don't it's know. It's one or both. He's in yeah, the sky. It's at least. Yeah, he is in the sky. And he's kicking himself because today is probably the biggest news day of the year. But un be unanticipated. The news day of the century. Unanticipated. I, I'm trying to. Trying to remember this much news at one time. I thought just with the memo leak that we would have a five-hour show, and then. We're gonna we're gonna be going back on this one because uh, I'm only I've only begun to an uh, <laughs> to an, uh, analyze that that leak. There's an incredible bonanza of content in there. Yeah. Uh, so we'll discuss some of it. Yeah, sure. Uh, but before we get to that, I think we have to talk about mm -hmm. Panos Panay leaving Microsoft and going to Amazon. <laughs> what the what? Yeah, um, just as kind of background on this, uh, Amazon held their devices event today. You might have watched it. I um, couldn't. I couldn't. I wasn't okay. invited. You watched oh, you it. Oh, it wasn't. Yeah. It didn't stream. You have to. It was a right. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, so all the expected kind of Fire uh, TV, you know, Alexa type devices and everything. Um, big push for generative AI in Alexa, right? Which is, um, uh, you know, Microsoft missed this opportunity. You know, Cortana has gone. Um, Google curiously is talking about this in other places, but not with assistant is I, as soon as I saw this kind of thing, I thought this is where this should be. It should be in these voice assistants. Right. Yeah. Um, so we'll look at that in a little more detail, uh, not later in the show, but I'm going to look at that, uh, probably over the weekend, frankly, but, uh, I'm going to go back and kind of relook at that part of it. I think that's really interesting. Um, but anyway, Dave, uh, um, Amazon devices and services has been led by a long time by a guy named Dave Limp. And he is, he announced earlier this year, his intention to retire before the end of the year. And so, um, when this <laughs> announcement came, uh, which Microsoft announced, uh, and provided me some information on separately, which I thought was kind of nice. And then Panos, I think might've tweeted something about it. Um, of course the first question was the, about the timing yeah. and why. Well, my question right? is fired or quit. Well, okay, we're going to get to this. So, <laughs> so timing then, is one. Yeah. And then there's that report uh, that came out of Bloomberg, I believe, that he was going to be going to uh, Amazon. Yeah. Of course, and taking over the devices business was the way Bloomberg described it. So I don't know if he's literally succeeding David Limp or if he's going to do part of that job, right? I, I don't know. So there's somebody already um, there. Okay. Sorry. So if that's I, what you're this, saying? This, you know, uh, this is the report. And it's uh, Dina Blass, so Dina Bass, rather. So a, a very reliable report. Um, we will see. So, yeah, why? Why now? Like, what's going on here, right? Uh, the last time we saw Panay, 
was back at build 2023 in May, which I think everyone, whatever one thinks of him, because this guy was, of course, divisive. Uh, some people thought he was the greatest presenter in the world uh, and, a, and a great advocate for Microsoft hardware and software. Others thought he was awkward and weird and, um, you know, you can make your own <laughs> decision on that one. But his uh, his uh, session or his part, his bit of the Build 2023 keynote was one of the weirdest things I've ever seen in a Microsoft event ever. He was off kilter. It wasn't just awkward and weird in his normal fashion. It was something was wrong. And um, I eventually, um, I can't say discovered, I, I, based on the information provided by a source, I wrote about it, we would have talked about it on the podcast, this notion that at the very last minute, all of his news items were taken away from him by Satya Nadella, who wanted to have all the announcements because this was their big AI kind of coming out party uh, for developers and also for this, for strategy. And um, I, my understanding, my belief is that he was supposed to be the one announcing the information about Windows Copilot and everything that was happening on the client. And when you strip that part of his talk out, um, you are left with nothing. And he was, and this guy, you know, again, uh, everyone has their opinions, but the one thing I think is an objective truth is that he was not very good with off the cuff uh, type situations. Um, he needed to be heavily prepared. And even then he was still kind of, you know, weird and awkward, but um, uh, one of the things I am aware of is that, um, you know, this is pre pandemic because of the timing, but the last two, three, four, maybe events that we went to in person where he was speaking, um, he actually brought in fans, uh, to sit in front of the journalists because he didn't like the feedback he was getting from journalists. Oh, like we weren't applauding and cheering and oh, you know, whatever. Interesting. Huh. And he needed that kind of thing. And so we were all sitting in the back of the room, like what's going on here. And, um, so, you know, it was already getting weird. Um, so that build 20, uh, 2023 appearance was a disaster, no matter how you slice it. And of course, the question you have to ask yourself is, did that have anything to do with this? Right. Was that the beginning of wait, what's going on here or whatever? And right now my sources are indicating no. <laughs> so that those things had nothing to do with each other. Um, I don't know. Um, so apparently he's landing in Amazon devices. Apparently he's maybe la leading the devices part of that. Um, I have now heard from multiple sources inside Microsoft, executives, employees, former employees, um, about him as happens, right? The, the, the smack talk begins when <laughs> there's no fighting back to be had, right? No pushback. Um, and the consensus on him is kind of what I always thought. Um, uh, a lot of people didn't think he was qualified. A lot of people were not impressed with his, um, so pumped though. accomplishments. Hmm? He was so pumped. Yeah. I don't want to get into this too, too much. I mean, th the weird thing for me was I had a personal relationship, frankly, with the previous three people who ran windows. Right. And, um, and to varying degrees. I mean, um, Terry Myerson would call me sometimes almost like I was a therapist. You know, um, Steven Sanofsky, who was hot and cold, depending on the day and how much, what he liked or didn't like about what I wrote most recently was either my best friend in the world or my worst enemy. And he would also send me, he wouldn't call me, but he would send me these incredible 2000 word emails in the middle of the night, um, <laughs> either ranting or exulting about something. Right. And Panay was nothing, you know, Panay was, um, you never heard an outsider. From yeah. He did I, well, steal I'll your, I, I'll he stole your laptop once, right? Yeah, I mean. no, he knew who I was. <laughs> so <laughs> I'll, I, I have a few Panay stories, but he, um, you know, you got to remember, and this is the thing I never quite understood, right? So this guy came to Microsoft to design mice and keyboards. That's what he was doing. And so how he went from what? that to creating a computer <laughs> and then convincing oh. Steven Sanofsky that this thing made sense. And then Steven Sanofsky going to Balmer and the board and being rejected multiple times before they all finally agreed it was the right idea and it wasn't, but whatever is one of those crazy stories that, I mean, just, I, I'm, I feel like there's a crucial detail I'm missing some, some insight, some, you know, that, that he has this capability or skill that I'm not aware of that I, you know, but um, uh, for him, you know, okay. So we run surface. It's okay. It's a hardware line. It's kind of a small thing. Um, obviously very controversial when they first came out with it. Um, but when he took over Windows, I, I just, you know, bringing that amount, that type of, or his style, uh, how do I say this? I'm trying to be diplomatic here. It was kind of 
form over function, frankly. Yeah. Um, I often joke with this, uh, with Sachin Adela, which is really unfair because he's an engineer and a very smart person. But I, I would joke about him that if you took one of his speeches and put it into Word and had Word condense it down to a synopsis, it would come up with nothing because there was nothing said. And I really feel like that was kind of what Panay was all about. He was, um, he never really said anything of substance and never really did anything of substance. And I think you could be very critical objectively of all the boats that surface missed, all the technologies they let slip, the every single time came up with a last uh, generation processor right as a new one was coming out. Do you think those and were his decisions? He led the group. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there were um, uh, factors that contributed to this uh, pricing, you know, uh, cost structures that he's, you know, he had, you know, couldn't do anything about it, I'm sure. Yeah, but, I mean, that's uh, a, I big, just, a big battleship that, you know, it's hard so, to... I don't know if yeah. one man can Our, control it. I mean, all I know about him was his presentations. So I, which, I have okay, no wait, idea. What's your take on his presentation well, they were, style? Like, they were dopey. They were terrible. We always made fun of Weird, him. right? And yeah. I, I think it was just he was trying to be Steve Jobs, and he wasn't. Uh, this is, I, We're so far past the point anyone should be trying that. Well, I understand I just, that. But I wouldn't I think judge right, his way, performance I, on that. I mean, that's okay. That's Because okay. that's not his real job. Is He wasn't hired as a presenter. He was hired to run well, but Except that he was. Hardware. <laughs> Oh. All right. Well, not originally, right? But he was, but that became his role. Like, in other words, this was a thing I had talked to Terry Myerson about, right? The, um, you know, when you lead a group uh, at Microsoft and you're going to, um, your group is going to present some information, that person wants to do that, <laughs> right? They don't want to give it away to underlings because God forbid that goes over really well. And then that underling is viewed as being more important than maybe they get promoted over you and that kind of thing. And so this is like a, a weird political thing that absolutely, you know, is a thing. But the, I think the thing people need to sort of understand about Microsoft and public presentations is that they have a business inside of Microsoft that teaches executives and other people how to speak publicly. And it is a grueling ongoing process and there is no end to it unless you're really good at it. And um, I have to think that this was like uh, someone forcing him to do homework on weekends every time because he was, he just never got good at it. You know, Terry, Myerson started off very poorly, I would say, from a public presentation perspective, but then he, you know, he got better over time. And that's usually what happens to people when they have more experience, you know, and I, I look, it's hard. I've, I was always terrible at public presentations, but my key skill, if I, you know, if I have to point one out is that I was good at the off the cuff stuff. So Q and A, that kind of thing, you know, if something went wrong, you could just keep talking. Right. And he was just the exact opposite of that. And, uh, and I just found that weird. I, most people who, well, most people who are on stage that much <laughs> want to be there and do develop skills. And I, I, I always found his whole thing to be very strange. Um, but, you know, personally, I would just say um, the other thing that those people that ran Windows had in common was that they understood where I was coming from. And what I mean by that is that critical uh, feedback, right, is constructive. And it comes from a place literally of love, meaning I love the product. I love the people that use it. I want this thing to be good. And I always kind of compared it to, um, you know, my kid comes home with a bad report card and, uh, I still love the kid, but I'm still going to yell at him and we're still going to punish that kid. And that is one way to show love in a way, right? Because we want that kid in this case to do the best that they can do when they weren't doing it. And um, I never, I very clearly, in fact, I know explicitly that was not the case with Panos Panay. He did not understand that. And uh, Steven Sanofsky had this problem actually uh, at times. Um, the, any criticism was just, it was an us versus you mentality and and uh, whatever. My my first interaction with Steve, with um, Panos Panay was just as awkward and weird as my first one with Steven Sanofsky. Um, when I first met Steven Sanofsky, it was after he had emailed me for the very first time because I had leaked something about some future version of Office and asked me to take it down, which I did for a time. And when I met him uh, at the next Office event, because he was, you know, speaking, I walked up to him and uh, he was talking to a couple of guys. It was a lull in the conversation. I said, Steve, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to introduce myself. I'm Paul Therott. And he literally just looked at me and he looked me up and down and then he turned back and just kept talking. Uh, and it didn't acknowledge me in any way, shape or form. But I was like, okay, here we go. Oh. Um, the first time I met Panos Panay, he was coming to Boston and I got a, someone from PR reached out and said, Hey, could you meet with him at the Boston store? And I said, sure. You know, they had the Microsoft store then. 
And so I went in and um, <laughs> they went, I thought we were going to sit out oh, there tables and things. And he's like, uh, no, no, we're going out back. And uh, we went into this kind of bar- back dark room with no windows. It was way in the back of the store. And someone closed the door and it was just me and him. And he said, and I, I, this was right either after surface two had launched or it was just about to launch. And I had received a mother load of leaks about this product. I fully leaked it to the world, whatever, it, it, everything. The only thing I got wrong was I thought the, it was white. It was just an off color photo. It was gray. You know, the machine was not black anymore, but I had the whole, everything, all the specs, all the pictures, all the, whatever. And, um, he demanded to know, uh, who had given me this information. Which I said, I don't know if you can know, demand, you know but works, you're, uh, you're never going to you know, give it to him. Yeah. I'm like, that's not how that works. I can't do my that. Sources. He was insane. He, he was positive. I was going to give him this information. And I just thought, man, this no. is a really weird way to get off, uh, uh, you know, to get on with this guy. Huh. Yeah. So I eventually just sort of said, so I'd be mean, serious. That was the point of the meeting right? was for him. Yeah. To- that's all he wanted. That's what he wanted me to rat on whoever it was. <sighs> what an ass. And I was just like, <laughs> man, dude, like, this is sorry. And uh, no, the answer was no. So. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess the to find one quote was pretty good from somebody. Um, Do you think he, <laughs> he didn't like you from that point on? Yeah. Yeah. I think he saw me as adversarial, you know? Um, well, I think he was the reason know. I didn't get a bunch of the devices for review. Yeah. I mean, there I were petty little things like with Apple as well. I mean, I, that's our job. Yeah. Our job is not to be a cheerleader for, a, I mean, a company. I'm not patting myself on the back, but when it comes to like windows PC reviews, I think I'm pretty good. <laughs> You know, and, and you're I do pretty well known and you're significant in the I think field. So, so, you know, I look again, I, I, you know, but, but, you know, after Surface Pro 3, well, I don't know, maybe it was after Surface Pro 4, you know, the whole Surface Gate thing, which I coined that term. And I'm sure he did not like that. Um, I've been very critical of the leadership at Surface, meaning him, frankly, and their decisions and well, the no ignoring USB C <laughs> for so many years. <laughs> no wonder he didn't no, but, like you. But that's not well, yeah, yes and no. But yes and no, job. right? In I other mean, words, where am I coming from? Like, here's a here's an idea. Have a discussion with me, you know? Um I so just to give you an idea of a, the difference between like meetings you might have in private with someone like that. One year I was going to CES and Microsoft did not have uh, no longer had presence there. And this is um, the year before Microsoft announced, uh, the year probably that Microsoft announced Windows S mode or Windows 10 S, whatever. So I got to reach out. Someone said, hey, uh, Terry wants to meet you at the whatever, blah, wherever it is. And I went into this. It was just me and him in a big room. We were talking. And he was telling me that this thing that was called Windows 10 Cloud was coming. And I told him this was a bad name. And he said, yep, no, we, we're going to change the name. Everyone agrees it's terrible. Name. <laughs> but then he told me about how uh, they were going to charge for it. And that, it, but that if anybody, no, they were going to charge for it, but only for like, you know, after a certain period of time, like two or three months or something. And I was like, Oh, I said, that's not a good idea. And, uh, you know, he's like, why? And I said, well, you know, I had, I just checked into my terrible hotel last night coming here to Vegas. I got in the middle of the night, stood in line for 40 minutes with so many people waiting to check in. And then I get up there and I look at my bill and it's literally twice what they said it was going to be. Cause I booked it through Expedia like a jerk. And I said, how come this bill is so expensive? And it was all like, you know, all these extra fees. And it's like that little, it's like that gotcha moment is what yeah, I call it's it. resort fees. And I, and, and yeah, I said, that's yeah. what you're doing to customers. I said, yeah. you know, you're giving them this crappy version of Windows and then they want to switch to the real thing. And it's a gotcha moment. Like yeah. they're going to pay another 50 bucks. And I will never forget this moment. I've told the story in writing at least, but he, you know, we were in a conference room. So he, he leaned back in his chair. So he was almost parallel to the ground and he, st- he was staring up at the ceiling and he, I won't say it, but he was, it was like F word, but he, he drew it out like, <sighs> like over like, you know, 10 seconds. And I'm like, Terry, come on. I can't be the first person that came up with this idea. Like this is, you know, whatever. But anyway, they changed it. And the way they changed it was they extended the time. And then they secretly said, we're never going to charge anybody. Like we're just, we're not going to charge for this. Cause it would be that gotcha moment. Right. You could do that or you could do what Panos did, which was to slowly cut me out of the thing. They, he would do petty things like um, a bunch of devices would come out and he would only let me review the really cheap little thing instead of, you know, the nice one or whatever. And it's like, dude, I, this is not my audience. I, you know, my audience isn't buying the toy. They're getting the, you know, the enterprise device. So I just, uh, there was that. And then, uh, you know, there are people who, um, you know, obviously is my opinion uh, biased in some way. Yeah, probably. Right. But, uh, I've, I've been doing this for a long time. <laughs> I've dealt with a lot of these people. I've never seen anything quite like him. There uh, is and a, one guy, uh, this uh, is a pet peeve of mine, which is, uh, it's happening yeah. across the tech industry. Uh, because of the, 
this is a little inside baseball, folks. I apologize, yeah. but because but you should know because you should consider this when you look at reviews because of the rise of the influencer in in the and particularly in YouTube, but TikTok and everywhere else. Mm -hmm. Uh, these companies have realized, oh, you know, these, you know, these guys have millions of views, yeah, whether they I have know. the influence, I don't know, but they have millions of views and they're right. much more amenable because they're not mm -hmm. journalists. They're much <laughs> more right. amenable to much more stroking right. and let's you know take a the, picture um, and all that stuff. And I, so as I, a result, they don't want to deal with you because right. you're they don't not. Want to create, we we so can just nice. be praised all the time. Well, let's just do that. You know, I don't think that's healthy, by the way. And but, I mean well, that bad on for many, many levels. Because we, it's all, but it's all, yeah, it now is, they're yeah. getting their information yeah. from people who have effectively been suborned. You they're know what, not, I would say this is bad for the company. It's bad for the product. And it's bad for that person who made that decision, including the leader of that business, because this is, everyone knows this. It's simple, right? You don't just listen to yes men. You, you gotta, you have to have people pushing back saying, hold on a second. This isn't right. Especially when it's coming, like I said, from a place, the right place. I call it a place of love, but it's a a place of constructive criticism. I care about this stuff. Like, I want it to be as good as well, it can be. It's not apparent that Microsoft listens to users either. I hate to say it, but. Yeah, well, listen, this is my <laughs> lifelong struggle. So, <laughs> you know, um, you know, anyway, so here we are. I, 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 I would just, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Well, um, Terry Myerson, who I like quite a bit. You know, after a while goes by, you learn some things about him that weren't great. And I have a little more nuanced view on this. I'm hoping and expecting I will learn more about this person and what happened over time. And we'll see. Right. I don't who, want I don't who's running. To be, who's running it now? Is it, Do you know the person yeah, who's running it now? Yeah. This is, so this is actually kind of interesting. So Microsoft sent me a, uh, a little insight. Uh, well, they, I think they might have published this at some point, This, but they sent me a note. And part of it was the. Uh, the, like this internal letter that they had written explaining what was happening, you know, such as they do. Um, Microsoft is essentially, you got to remember, so Panos Panay was the, you know, the chief product officer. By the way, there's another little bit of kind of, I'll call it douchery that occurs when you start to uh, get into a situation where you can invent your own pro, your own yeah. title. Like yeah. that's a, so he, he got into that stratosphere. But he, remember, this was a guy who worked in the hardware group at Microsoft, became uh, the leader of the Surface team. And then took on Windows as well. So as chief product officer, he actually had uh, two of the three major businesses That's that are interesting. more personal computing. Yeah. Um, Terry Myerson was actually in charge of more personal computing, right? And so when he left, there was kind of a weird void. It was kind of uh, Rajesh uh, and, but not really. And there were people kind of doing little bits of it. And there were teams working on user experience and whatever else. Um, this time they very explicitly divided up this guy's um, responsibilities. So there are actually three people, um, all, all of whom um, uh, report to R Rajesh Jar is still there, uh, as did uh, Panay, actually. Um, but the Windows part of it has, uh, so we have somewhat, we have, I think it's two people are leading uh, a, a team that includes Surface. It's kind of interesting. So all of the people we associated with Surface, uh, Stevie Batiche, the guy we love so much, and Rolf, and whoever else is, is part of this new team that includes some other stuff, which is kind of interesting. Uh, they're building uh, silicon systems and devices that span Windows, client, and cloud for an AI world. Hint, hint about that thing next week, right? uh, tomorrow rather. Um, that's interesting. But the Windows bit has gone to Yusuf Mehdi. This is a guy, he's been at Microsoft uh, since the, I don't know exactly, mid-90s, I would imagine, early 90s. I met him for the first time in 1998 when I went to the Windows NT 5.0 technical workshop. The product became Windows 2000. Um, he was with Windows for a long time. He left over time. He went to, uh, it was different names over time, but what was Windows Live, remember? Um, and then uh, Xbox, he was there for quite a bit. And he was at Bing most recently. In fact, he was the executive who gave the presentation back in February about Bing chat. So now he's come back into the fold. That's very interesting to me. And actually, I'm sorry, he is the leader of the tech of Windows and Surface, um, which is this kind of subgroup under uh, this other stuff. So I, I don't know. Uh, when you see that one executive leaves and it requires three different teams <laughs> with three different executives, there's two different ways to see that. One was this guy was so amazing <laughs> that his job cannot be done by one other person or 
we realized putting that much uh, power and that much uh, product or whatever under one person maybe was not the best idea. And that what these things need is uh, different leadership. And particularly in this age, because we're going into this AI thing, which we'll talk a lot about later, right? That maybe he wasn't the right guy for this part of uh, right. the, 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 the thing. So you know? I don't know. It, it, from the outside, it looked like he got a job offer at Amazon and decided to leave Microsoft and go to Amazon. You don't. Well, he that, was he was rumored to have been trying to go to Apple several years ago. Right. right? That's right. rather embarrassing. A lot of their um, <laughs> uh, promoting of Surface over the years has been a direct comparison with right. MacBook Pros right. and iPads and so forth. And you can uh, someone as image conscious as this guy was, uh, which is weird for all of the rings and uh, chains he wore and whatever and the kind of tortured uh, style of the man. But um, he's image conscious, right? Whatever. Um, clearly I am not, so maybe I should just shut the hell up about that. But, uh, you know, Amazon though, like Amazon. So I, <laughs> I, um, I don't know what to say to this, right? Uh, Surface as a product has obviously evolved from a strategy perspective many times over the years. It, it, people forget this, but the initial generation of products, which was Surface RT and the initial Surface Pro. The expectation inside of Microsoft is that the RT device, the thing that was most like the iPad, right, would outsell the, the Pro by a, a, an order of magnitude. This was the future. And it, that when this took off, this was the generation that went, or the direction that Windows was going to go in. It was going to turn into more of this device thing. That is not what happened. I think everybody understands there was a write down, write off, whatever it was, of almost a billion dollars. They had to dump all that inventory. The RT. And, uh, that was when uh, Satya came in. Uh, and killed the the successor, right? This whole idea of the kind yeah. Of low so the timing on this device, yeah. yeah. I, I I look. There was a there was a huge overreaction to Apple and multi touch that occurred under Steven Sanofsky, and, yeah, yeah. and he kind of spread it like a cancer throughout Microsoft, right? Um, and that overreaction included a lot of things, but some of them were Windows eight, right? Which sort of um, ignored the one hundred percent of the installed base, which were desktop and laptop computers and said the world's going to be this iPad thing. Um, there was also Surface, right? Uh, and then there were all the touch um, first app uh, initiatives uh, around U UWP as a platform, but also what was called, you know, Metro Modern or whatever back in the day. Uh, but also uh, Microsoft Office, which people also forget. They were going to drop the desktop versions of Office and move to the mobile versions. And wow. they had that dream, you know, that the apps were wow. going to work on whatever device and, you know, one Windows and blah, 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 whatever. Uh, it took those guys about six months to realize this is never, it's not happening now and it's not happening ever. And they completely scaled back from that. But that was why we had gotten the one successful office app on UWP, which was OneNote for Windows 10, right? Um, they also explicitly uh, killed desktop OneNote and said, this is where all the future's happening. We're putting all the new features here. And then everything went south and they had to go back on that too. And now that's the, the lame duck sitting in the store getting no updates, right? So, Everything changed, right? I mean, there was a whole mess. That happened in 2012. That was the release of Windows 8 and Surface. The iPad happened in 2010, right? The iPad in 2007. So there's your predecessors for this, your predicators yeah, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, Windows 10 was the correction, right? We're going to, Windows, well, Windows 8, 1X, you know, there was a bunch of response. Yeah. 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 But they fixed it. So 8 1, they brought back the start button. Right. 8 1 1, they brought back the start menu. Windows 10, they brought back the desktop focus. You know, they, <laughs> there, was a, there was a big reversal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard turning the battleship. So uh, what was his contribution in all this, right? I mean, like, was he there? When did he like, start running that? Yeah. So let, think about that. <laughs> this is like, this is awful. I, 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 th I don't mean this to be so critical, but, but seriously, think about this. Jim Alchin, right? This, this wonderful man, this technical, uh, engineer, uh, did good and bad, right? Horrible during the Microsoft antitrust trial on the stand, but, uh, led windows during a very critical era. He led windows at a time when they had to decide whether web technology or native. I think he made that wrong choice, by the way, he went native, dropped all the web stuff. Um, but Vista happened on his watch, windows XP, windows 2000. Um, he left because of Vista, right? So Vista Longhorn debacle was the end of him. Um, Steven Sanofsky, Windows 7, right? Everyone kind of uh, holds him up for this incredible accomplishment. I would argue that was a service pack for Vista, but fine. Uh, but also Windows 8, big ideas. I disagree with all of them, but, but at least ideas. I mean, the guy yeah. was shooting yeah. for the stars. There's yeah. no doubt about yeah. it. 
um, things changed a lot. The Windows is very diminished compared to the smartphones and tablets of the world. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. by the time you get to Terry Morrison, he has to kind of clean up this mess mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that Windows to developers is as important as any other platform. And the idea there is billion, we're going to get a billion devices. And it, that's about as big as Android and iOS at the time. And uh, no one will ignore this. And there were lots of initiatives around all those bridges, you know, we used to talk about and all this stuff, and none of it ever worked. And the problem was that the UWP thing was always broken to begin with. It was never, it was a, a good idea in theory, but a poorly implemented. Um, Sachin Adela came in 2014, 2015, somewhere in there, killed Windows Phone immediately. Didn't communicate it to the world, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we had to deal with that for a little while. But that was the end of the that was the end of the one Windows dream. Once you, once you get rid of Windows Phone, having an app platform on Windows that can sort of work with different devices doesn't even matter anymore. You know, Hololens was never going to sell at volume. The Xbox didn't really have a big need for apps, and frankly, those the size and shape of that screen, the the Windows apps would have been fine, right? So, you know, here we are. <laughs> I don't know, but so Panos Panay, what was his accomplishment, right? Um, he put lipstick on a pig. That's what he did. He put the Windows 10 X UI, which was developed before him and had nothing to do with him, on Windows um, as Windows 11. And that's all that was. Worse, he, he, they, <laughs> that team also stripped out a bunch of features in the uh, name of simplicity, which I got to tell you, I do respect. Um, the problem is you, got, you have to do it right because by nature, if you are looking at a UI that's really busy and has lots of stuff going on, and you strip it down to a really simple UI where only a few things are going on, you're losing functionality. And um, that's what they did. They lost a lot of functionality without really paying attention to what was important to users. Because the we're two years in now, right? So the first year was just a bunch of complaining about all the stuff. I'm right-clicking, I don't see this. Or the inconsistencies. I right-click on the desktop and it's the Windows 10 menu. But when I right-click on the taskbar somewhere else, it's a Windows 11 menu. And, you know, it was rushed to market. I'm not saying that was his fault, actually. I don't know whose fault that was. But... Uh, it was incomplete, um, functional regressions all over the place. And, um, you know, here we are. It's two years later. We're about to release a new version of Windows 11, thir third version. And we're kind of where we should have been three years ago, frankly. Right? This is what Windows 11 should have been from the beginning, what, we, what we're about to get. Um, so is that, an, I don't know. Is that his fault? Is it an accomplishment? I don't know what to call that. But that was the, that was the entire state of his run. <laughs> so the, the other so there's one scenario which is he's you know he doesn't have to move he can work for amazon it's it maybe a better job mm -hmm. maybe they offered him a lot of money so he quit and he goes there the other scenario right. is his her i mean let's face it weird and horrific performance at, right. at the was it night uh, the the last event uh, the build build, build, build rather yeah, yeah. what I mean, it wasn't so bad that I would say, oh, we better get rid of this guy. It felt like See, he, I, I thought it was so, it was so bad to me. I was like, I, it was I don't bad, know how we move forward. We felt like there was a rug pull, right? Like he had been yeah, told did, yeah. he was going to do true. a normal presentation. And then somebody said, yeah, no, see, Satya wants to do it tomorrow. The that's the, listen, when, when things go wrong is when you learn what people are all about. Right? <laughs> yeah. No, it really is. No, I mean that. I, I mean, and, he should you know, have said, example, I, there's nothing for me to do. I don't want this uh, presentation now because you took away right. all the well, meat. His names, I know, I know. He could have done. There's all kinds of ways we could have handled it. I'm sure, you know. So you, I'm sure so, Nixon wish he did something different. With the I know. Tips, you know, I'm just, but I just, I'm trying so, to get you. I know you don't want to like commit, and mm -hmm. so I know this is pure speculation. Who knows? Okay. But if you were gonna bet, just right. like I know it's fifty fifty. But did he quit? Was he fired? I don't know. And I, if I had to guess. I think it was a combination of uh, so here, he here's saw the right. Oh, this sometimes I, I do does happen. Guess. I've had this happen to me where you can see the writing's on the wall; it's not going so well, yeah. and you go. Let's, here's what the writing by on mutual, the wall is. by mutual agreement. See ya. Yeah, this is a guy who clearly always wanted more power, right? Um, well, he got it. I, if I he think was there he to used, make mice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I think he used the Apple thing as leverage because going to Apple. Think about like what would Panos Panay have done at Apple. They would not have put him in charge of any part of the hardware. You know, he would have been there maybe, but he, he they, were, they already have amazing people at Apple, right? So he would have been in a more subservient role, but I bet he would have accepted if he had to. I think he want. I don't know really. I don't really know what he wanted, but I wouldn't be surprised if he wanted that. But I also think he, and this is based on, this is not just me guessing, but I, he used this as leverage. Uh, and it was part of the, okay, you can have micro, you can have Windows too. I think that was part of, like he just wanted more and more power. This is the problem with every, you know, Snofsky had this problem, right? You always want more. And I, 
this is my guess, and I this and this kind of makes sense from a um, educated guest perspective. Uh, Microsoft is undergoing a transformation right now that they announced internally last November and are now implementing publicly over time. We learned some of it in February. We learned some of it. I want to say it was March ish when they talked about Microsoft 365 Copilot. We learned a bunch of it in in May at Build, and that was when Stevie Batish talked about the alongside inside outside you know uh, generations of ai that would occur with apps right and we're going to learn a bunch of it tomorrow which we're going to talk about uh soon or later today anyway um and that as part of the shift the the old structure that was microsoft that that was his part of microsoft i think was going away and i think he would he was losing power um when i use this where's this quote uh microsoft is creating a team and has a desire to build silicon systems and devices that span Windows client and cloud for an AI world. That's not just what he was doing. That's a bigger thing. And he was not the guy who was going to run that. And since that was the case, that is a combination of them wanting, maybe wanting to diminish him and him saying, no, I don't want less power. I want more. This would be seen as a demotion. And oh, look, David Limp is retiring. And I don't know who reached out to who. It's possible. If this had happened a year ago, he would have said, Amazon, what are you kidding me? And, but because the way it happened, you know, because of the timing and what's happening this year at Microsoft, I think that's what opened the door. So I don't know that where the push was sense. or, you know, that makes sense. I think so. so. I that's think so. a, that's probable what happened, you know, knowing how corporations work and so forth. Yeah. That's my, has idea. there been, has Microsoft sent out a note? I mean, is there an, is, yeah. is the traditional letter from Satya Nadella saying, Thank, yeah. you, thank there, you. There was a there was a letter internally, and then I also received something. Um, oh, okay. They've told the yeah. I saw the internal letter, but I meant like publicly. They have, yeah. No. Yeah. They yeah. No. They okay. they they've acknowledged it. And what did they he's say? A, they say we, is, we we thank him for his many contributions over the years. Yeah, they're and, not going to say uh, we fired him. No. <laughs> you know. Yeah, but they are well. Yeah. They, sometimes there's hints. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all I so I, my hints come from people internally. Right? Yeah, yeah, that's a better I, in fact. Source. As we were talking, I just got an email from somebody okay, who says, "Okay, the, the question here is pushed or jumped? Pushed or right? jumped? That's the question." And um, this, he so what he's telling me, actually, like, really, let me read this a moment. Go ahead, before take I say your this time. You know, while you do that, this would be a good time for me to do an ad. <laughs> there you go. You can okay. read your your <laughs> read your email, and we'll answer the go. musical question: pushed or jumped. And just, yep. <laughs> it's a fascinating story. And we're just beginning because right. there was a huge memo accidentally leaked during discovery in another court case uh, and thousands of pages of information about Microsoft's plans with Xbox and more. We'll get to that. And there's a big AI event tomorrow. Paul thinks this is going to be major. We'll get to that. Uh, I'm sorry, Richard isn't here. Either he planned this yeah. carefully to avoid... A little extra work, I think. More likely, he's sitting on the ah. plane, going, "Damn it, <laughs> damn it, Jim!" He strike me as a as a slacker. <laughs> no, he's no slacker. I'm sure. Well, next week <laughs> he'll, he'll be back next week, and I'm sure he'll have lots to say about this. Our show today brought to you by Nureva. Love these guys. Nureva Meeting Room Audio Technology. It has a history of wowing IT pros, and it frankly wowed me. Nureva solves a big problem for your huddle room, your meeting room, big or small. It solves the problem of some people being here. We do. We we still have meetings where, you know, there are. We just had our big sta sta all hands meeting yesterday. Some people are in the room, big room. It's in the studio. Some people are on the Zoom, far away. And the problem is those poor people who aren't in the room can hardly hear. And Nureva solves this. It's amazing technology ask duquesne university they they have literally 100 nareva devices installed uh, one of their senior technologists recently said i can quote this i cannot say enough about how impressed i am audio has been my life's work for 30 years and i am amazed at what a nareva mic and speaker bar will do it's all because of this patented technology nareva has the microphone mist technology that puts Hundreds of virtual microphones everywhere in the room so everyone can be heard no matter where they are, no matter where they're facing, no matter whether they're on the floor or in the ceiling, whatever. Nareva's made another leap forward with the introduction of this new Pro Series. I don't know, have you seen these? Featuring uh, the HDL310, that's for large rooms, and the HDL410 
for extra large rooms like we were just uh, using yesterday. For the first time, you can get pro audio performance and plug and play simplicity in the same system. You know, in the past, you know, what people did, and you've, you've, you've probably seen this if you work for a big company, they spend tens of thousands of dollars setting up a giant conference room with expensive professional AV stuff. It takes a lot of manpower. It takes wiring. And, and more, most importantly, it's an ongoing maintenance issue because it constantly has to be calibrated, reset, set up again. The cost is through the roof, but not with Nareva. Nareva is simple. You can install it. If you can install a soundbar, you can install a Nareva. And it continues to amaze IT pros. The Pro Series is something else. Uh, you can go to online. Their online demo highlights the Nareva audio expert. And you can hear how that person is heard clearly from under a table, from behind a pillar. Obstructions don't matter. Where you're facing doesn't matter. Pickup performance, other systems just can't match. Unless you put microphones everywhere. You don't, trust me, <laughs> you don't want to do that. So let's talk coverage. What do you need? Okay, the 410, which is for the extra large room, 35 feet by 55 feet. And it does it with just two mics and speaker bars. Not hundreds of mics, two mics and speaker bars. Imagine equipping a, an extra large meeting room or lecture hall. Lecture hall too, right? With just two discrete wall-mounted devices. You can even use them uh, and set them up. So you got the two devices. And if you have a, a divider, you can have it separate. You control it all from the Nareva console. The HDL410 also features a unified coverage map. So that process is mic pickup from the two devices simultaneously to create a giant single mic array. But it's not. It's like... It's, it's that microphone mist. It's thousands of mics. The uh, the It's little brother, the HDL310, covers spaces from 30 feet to 30 feet. That 30 feet by 30 feet. That's still pretty big. And that just takes one mic and speaker bar. And you can install it yourself in about 30 minutes. With continuous auto calibration, Nareva Audio automatically, continuously adapts to the changes in a room's acoustic profile. Pull that divider. It figures it out. It says, fine, we're going to split those. It does it automatically. And with Nareva Console, their cloud-based device management platform, the, it takes the pain out of things like firmware updates, checking device status, changing settings. One IT professional can do it without leaving her desk. It's awesome. It solves a huge problem. You need this thing. Learn more at Nareva.com slash twit. N-U-R-E-V-A dot com slash T-W-I-T. All right, I've stalled long enough. I've given Paul time to read <laughs> his secret email from someone yeah. who shall remain unnamed. Yeah, so this person is saying that with the layoffs that occurred back in March, Panos's team was gutted. Ah. And um, he oh. pushed back and yeah. pissed off some higher-ups, and the writing was on the wall. Now, I, I don't know anything about this, other than I will tell you, I've heard from multiple people in Windows and outside of windows what was the word that came, this came up more than once uh about just how um but this isn't how they said it but they they felt kind of beleaguered <laughs> like like they were yeah like nobody you know nothing they did was important and nobody appreciates that what happens they do in big companies you know? i can i can understand yeah. that well especially yeah. when you're in the part of the company that used to like run the company yeah and now you're just like a backwater yeah you know? it's fair you know i point this out a lot i mean the best talent at microsoft left Windows a million years ago. They're all working on, well, AI, right? I mean, now. So uh, this has been a problem for Windows uh, for a long time, right? It's just not the focus anymore. Um, you remember it was Windows only, Windows first. and win Windows, do we make Windows? Yeah. Oh, yeah, we make Windows. <laughs> That's good. Um, you know. <laughs> but but to, in their events, it's still a multi-billion dollar business. I mean, it's a, yep. it's very important no, to Microsoft. But I yeah, I understand the attention Yeah, but think, but think how thankless this task is. Yeah. Um, here's this, like you said, it's a multi-billion dollar business. I don't remember the, at one point I did like some just napkin math. I mean, it's somewhere huge. in the order of eight plus billion dollars yeah. in revenues a quarter. But you lead that business. What's your job? You're going to grow that? No, you just don't <laughs> lose it. Right. That's all you get to do is just not screw it up. Right. And that has to be hard. Right. Yeah. Um, so You're not in the fun part. You're not in the fun part. So the answer yeah, is I, he I mean, was both jumped and pushed. <laughs> like this illustration. <laughs> he was jushed. He was jushed. <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> um, I, we don't know. Do we I wish mean, honestly, him well? Still. Do we wish him well? I know you don't, but do we wish no, him well? I, no, no, no. I Listen, I really, the truth is I don't wish 
anyone no. ill. Yeah. I wish things were different um, between him and I. I wish things were different for Windows, you know, but... Um, Do you think I this is good for Windows? Yes. And Surface? <laughs> he's not He's not a... I don't know about Surface. Um, he is not a malicious presence no. like uh, Steven Sanofsky was. Yeah. But, but you know what? Like, what's worse? Like, uh, chaotic evil... Or just like, eh. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Benign I, I really evil. don't know. You know, or just benign neglect, yeah, right? Yeah. I don't know. And and by the way, as with this was true of Terry too. Remember, these are people who uh, presided over a diminished business, right? This was no longer the focus. So Steven Sanofsky at that time was still riding the wave of We Still Matter, even though it became patently obvious during his reign that we did, you know, it did not. But, um, you know, what do you, God, what a, what a mess to, to, you know, what an awful responsibility in so many ways. Right. Yeah. Terry made uh, horrible mistakes yeah. in the name of trying to meet the requirements that Satya Nadella laid out for him, which was right. make windows make sense in this cloud. It's kind company. of a no win situation. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I, I assume, and I'm sure this is true, the resources that were available to Panos Panay were far fewer. Yeah. You know, yeah. far less money, far fewer resources. Yeah. So, all right, is that his fault? You know, no, but I don't. You know, I don't know all the details. So, we'll see. I think the the history on this will be written eventually. I hope to be the person to write that. But uh, we'll, you know, but whatever, it's fine. I, I just want to know what happened, um, and we'll see. There you have it. He was jushed. He was jushed. <laughs> <laughs> all right. right. I don't want to spend the whole show on this because really, yes. the the Made most interesting thing to me. In yeah. the week's uh, Microsoft news was this leak. Now, how, tell me, first of all, how did it leak? <laughs> I don't know actually how it leaked, uh, like, uh, you know, like the mechanism by which it leaked. But there was this giant leak of documentation that came up out of the FTC um, hearings from back in June. Actually, this stuff does not is not dated from June 2023. Most of it is from, uh, I think, May 2023. Two, it was probably right? in but discovery that this it was, was yes it was last year um the, microsoft the, was providing information to the ftc the with theory regards to the, is the questions they were asking there was one document that they were providing in yep, discovery and there were a bunch of attachments and somehow <laughs> inadvertently yeah. well all these okay other that's things probably got attached. That's, that's based on uh the documents <laughs> that i you know have seen i will say that's probably roughly right i i um this based on the way they're formatted, it, it appears that there was supposed to be a very small thing. This <laughs> yeah. is the mother load. Whoops. So, yeah, of course, when this kind of thing happens, I don't, I guess, I don't know how it became public. Like, I, 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 it probably appeared somewhere on some public site or something. I don't know how it happened, but the immediate uh, blowback here was like, well, hold on a second. Like, who did this and why? Right. Is it someone internal to Microsoft trying to screw them over? Is it someone external to the FTC trying to say, see, you know, here's the the smoking gun that we, you know, we weren't able to talk about or something like that. And it turns out it was just a mistake. And it was, it was Microsoft's fault. They acknowledged this internally um, and uh, thus externally, because they knew that was going to leak. And um, in just in case it didn't leak, uh, Phil Spencer came out and said as much publicly on Twitter. Um, it's, you know, it was a mistake. And, you know, we need to do better. It's embarrassing to them on a number of levels. Uh, it's also a problem for Microsoft's partners because a lot of privileged information about right. third parties, right. including partners and competitors, came out as part of this uh, thing, which is one of the many reasons it's so fascinating and, and but problematic for Microsoft. I will say it's it doesn't take a an analyst of any <laughs> particular skill, I hope, to understand that... This is a problem for Microsoft on a lot of levels, right? Um, they have a, a big chunk of this is their strategy for roughly the next 10 years for Xbox. They have said things publicly, which are contradicted by this leak. Uh, for example, uh, Phil Spencer said, we have no plans for a mid-season replacement is the way I call it, like a mid, you know, mid life cycle uh, uh, upgrade or whatever for the Xbox Series X and S. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and it's coming up, they're both two of them. Are coming out next year right um so that's uh okay that's embarrassing um and then but there's also this thing like well first of all this is um like i said is about a year old so uh, things have changed right so now people have this idea about what's coming down the pike and that means that uh a they might have the wrong information because things do change right and two 
it means, oh, look, the next Xbox Series X and the next Xbox Series S are better than the current ones. It's Let's see, it's uh, September. I could wait a few months. Um, maybe I'm going to stop buying the product we're selling today. There's a reason you keep this information separate uh, se or uh, uh, private, I should say, or secret. Um, you know, when Google comes out and says, hey, this is what the Pixel 8 looks like, uh, they do it because it's like a month before the new phone's coming out and they're not selling any phones now anyway, right? <laughs> but this far in advance, yeah, <clears throat> right? Yeah. I mean, no, this far right. in advance, you can't, uh, you're screwing up a year of sales here. Yeah. Um, and, and you may be influencing themselves. partners. Yeah. There might be partners who say, you know what? Never I don't want to go through this again. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm gonna, maybe I'm going to lean on Sony a little bit here yeah. or, you know, go in a slightly different direction. So um, at a high level, uh, the... Oops, I keep screwing up the, uh, sorry, I screwed the notes. Let me fix that. It's not desirable. Let's put it that way. This it's is not, not good. It, it's, but it's, and, I, but we can consider it levels. accurate, right? Because. Oh, it's a hundred percent. Yeah, they've acknowledged These are, it. This is, oh, it's real. Yeah, yeah. this is real. So, oh my okay. Gosh. Here, here's the, here's the high level. There is an Xbox Series X refresh coming next year. Instead of a big um, rectangular kind of, uh, 2001 a space odyssey looking thing it's a, it's a trash basket you know it's circular it's a cone or whatever not a cone it's a uh, a cylinder um you know a minor things wi-fi 6e instead of 6 bluetooth 2.5 uh, there's a new xbox um uh wireless uh standard coming for lower latency etc cetera, etc cetera. better power management of course um there's nothing about the things that maybe are problematic for the current console with regards to Performance enabled uh, the ability to hit 4K 6, 60 frames or um, expand the storage with a standard NVMe M2 hard drive or blah, 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 whatever. There's none of that. But um, this is expected to come out in the fall of 2024 or $500 you know, accordingly, according to this at the time. Uh, two terabytes of storage, et cetera. Yeah, it looks pretty desirable. Um, it looks like a good machine. It looks nice. Yeah. Yep. It looks nice. Um, yep. What's Yeah, it does. You're right. Um, Xbox Series S, uh, not changing. Oh, I should say also discless. Careful how you say that. Um, the current X, of course, has the uh, <laughs> discless. Right? Uh, I often misspeak. I want to be careful there. Um, uh, the S in the current generation does not have a drive. Uh, this one also does not have a drive. So yeah, you know okay. nowadays you don't. I haven't put anything. No, I didn't. In my disc. I've never stuck a disc in there. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not. I've uh, never stuck my disc in it. Not on purpose, Leo. Not on purpose. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, <laughs> moving on. Um, there's also a Series S refresh coming in 2024. That's going to be a little, or, or was, it was, right? we don't know if it's going to happen. Uh, I think it's a little earlier. Um, same form factor this time, which is kind of interesting. They're not updating that at all. That's okay. I actually think the Series S is one of those perfect designs. It's kind of a, kind of a nice deal. Um, still white, uh, one terabyte of storage, just like the black version we have now. Uh, same low price, $299. Uh, same Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth. Uh, 5.2 and also the um uh, the, the new xbox uh wireless standard or whatever and you know more power management etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh, these are just um uh, you know they're, they are what they are they're they're refreshes of the existing I'm, and i'm sure there's some cost reduction going on as well um there's a new xbox controller with an accelerometer and wait for it cloud connectivity when right before Google killed Stadia, no, actually right after Google killed Stadia, I wrote an editorial where I wrote, I said, Stadia is dead and Xbox needs its best feature. And its best feature is what's in this controller. Cloud it's a controller. direct, yeah, right. It's a direct link Wi-Fi to this cloud instead of using the latency or whatever uh, to the, you know, going from the console, whatever the device is, because you can use this controller with, um, you know, uh, an iPad or a smart TV or whatever, right? So uh, this was very clearly the key innovation that Stadia brought to the game. And uh, and I feel bad about what happened to Stadia, i got to be honest. I thought that was a great um, uh, service. I think it was the best cloud streaming service at the time. Uh, of course, now maybe things have changed. Luna copied this, by the way. Amazon Luna yeah. also uses Direct Connect, right? Um, so, so this what, is so the... just for um, people who don't know, what it, uh, mm -hmm. instead of hooking this up to the, to the computer that is then hooked up to the internet, this joins right. the internet separately. The, the thing, right, so the, the the Achilles heel for cloud gaming, for cloud streaming, or whatever you want to call it, is lag and latency, right? Now, yeah. there's certain things no one can do anything about, your internet connection, right? right? right. But, but the key here, especially for fast games, especially for 3D games, especially for the Holy Grail, which I call honestly of think Duty. will never happen, yeah. Call of Duty multiplayer, right? Any yeah. first-person shooter, modern 4K, 60 frame a second, whatever it is, 
3D wonderfulness uh, in real time with multiple players. And some impossible. of them playing on their own machines as opposed to in the cloud. Then right. they have no you latency. Know, it's a disaster. Yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't work. Yeah. So how do you fix this? Um, well, the, the, the steps you can take today, there are three stages of performance slash uh, lack of latency that you can achieve with an Xbox controller. Um, the, the worst one is to use an Xbox controller with Bluetooth with whatever device. It doesn't matter if it's a PC, a console, your iPad, your TV, whatever it does. That's the worst because Bluetooth is terrible. Um, the next worst is the Xbox protocol, also wireless here. So it's wireless connection, but you have a native connection to, in this case, the console because that you do have that in the console. This Remember, people forget this too. But this was supposed to be part of the PC. Um, PC makers were going to add this chipset to their computer so you could have an Xbox uh, wireless connection that was low latency. Never happened. Uh, maybe someday we'll have a little set-top box. Uh, a lot of the leaked stuff talks about that, by the way. There's a lot of that talk in there. We'll get to that. Um, and then the the next step, the best step so far today is wired, you know, a USB-C on today's controller, wired connection to the device. Um and that's as good as you can do, but you're still going through a thing to get to the internet and, you, and you're still getting the information through a thing. So the connection and to the computer, which is then connected to the internet, adds latency. Whereas if you have mm -hmm. a Wi-Fi controller that's going directly to the, to the right. internet, it, it just but, reduces but, but, a yes, little but, bit of latency, but, right? But you, so you actually just kind of touched on the, the point of this, which is in, in a world in which increasingly people will be streaming games, supposedly, right, or whatever, in a world in which people could be, they today cannot play effectively against people who are using right. a dedicated huge, device. Huge disadvantage. And part of it is yeah. the, a huge part of it is the latency issue. So what we're going to do instead is connect the controller, as stated, directly to the cloud. Now, if you're playing on an Xbox um, or a PC or whatever, I mean, honestly, for you, you probably want to do the normal thing. I, this is a wireless thing. It's going to happen automatically. You don't have to think about it. But the idea here is that if you are connected wirelessly to an Xbox console, a PC, or whatever device, and you're playing a game, whether it's on the device or in the cloud, it should do the right thing. And so this new controller will support that. And the best approach for cloud gaming is that thing we were talking about, because this is the only way you can reduce the latency um, well, other than, you know, efficient protocols or whatever. But I mean, this is as far as like the step you can take, you can't direct hardware to the internet, right? All right. But we can eliminate that extra step in the middle and connect directly. It um, does make a Luna, difference because it really works with it Luna does. and it works no, with it really Stadia. does. Yeah. I played the same game on Stadia and Xbox. And I don't think I ever did the same game on Luna and Stadia, but Luna and Stadia both had an edge at the time. This is now a couple of years old, but... Um, and I think it was because of this, uh, and both scheme, of them had so. their own, sold their own controllers to do this. You can't use a regular That's right. controller to do yep. this. But this, this slide does not right? look like it's for consumers. This slide looks like it's for <laughs> retailers. This, yeah. So this slide is from a, uh, presentation that no, so none of these things are for retail. So, uh, Microsoft, there's a couple of different big events that, um, the presentations that leaked came from oh, okay. their internal presentations. Um, at least one of them was to the board of directors. Um, actually, you know, at least two of them, probably the idea was at, at, at various points in time, they had to go in front of the board and say, here's what we're doing. Here's our strategy. Here's where our business is now. Here's where it's going to be in X number of years. And the big one, and I think that's what this is from, um, is, was uh, literally at, well, at the time it was a 10 year strategy. Uh, like it was how, how we're going to get, how we got to where we are, where we're going, how this looks like a continuum. Like we've always had this idea in our brain. And, um, and what's going to change and what the market, uh, opportunity is. Uh, and by the way, the, the this, um, <clears throat> this particular slide deck, which was for the board of, um, directors, let me just, that click. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. This is clearly uh, this, internal, but, this, so, not, but the title, yeah. the title of this one, <laughs> which is funny, Sabine, gonna find yeah. it. No, you're going to love this. This is yeah. worse than you think is achieve industry leadership by 2030. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouldn't laugh. I know, I know. <laughs> and at that time, and this was 2022, Microsoft put itself in fourth place in the wow. gaming industry behind uh, Tencent, 33 billion in revenue, I guess probably annual revenues. Uh, Sony, 25 billion. Uh, Google, 18 billion. Um, they were 16 billion. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, full year 2021. And... I don't know if that's fiscal or calendar. It's probably calendar because these other companies have different schedules. Uh, Apple and Nintendo at that time were tied for fifth place with about 15 billion in gaming revenues. It, it's a stretch um, goal. That's a stretch goal. 
achieve dominance. Yeah, but but yeah. they but they spell out like how we're how are we going to get there? They get the roadmap, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and there's a roadmap, and it is incredible. Um, it's very interesting. Um, it, it, when and, you look at it, is it's not completely cray cray, right? No, no, no. I don't mean it like that. I, I, I it, it's it's just incredible how much there is, you know. Um, this is the it. kind of planning a big company does. Right. Uh, Plus, you know, they just never get to see with, it. Right. So, you know, Satya Nadella takes over Microsoft Cloud. You every he goes to everybody very pragmatically. A, you have to justify your existence. If you're not making money, we're going to start having a conversation. B, you need to make sense within my Microsoft and his Microsoft is Cloud. Right. This is when Microsoft 365 took over on the office side, right? Um, Windows was in kind of a tough spot because there's really no clear cloud play there. Now we finally have an AI thing we'll talk about in a little while. But, you know, for a long time, like uh, figuring that out, it, and by the way, Windows 365 is not the answer it, I, before anyone says that. That is not, no one really thinks that's the answer, but it's part of a puzzle, right? Um, Xbox was in slightly better shape because Microsoft has this cloud computing prowess and they can make these investments, and they do, and there's lots of figures about how much money they pumped into this stuff, to uh, A, make xCloud, and B, try to make it successful, have it compete against whoever's out there at the time, GeForce Now, or uh, Sadie at the time, or Luna, or whatever it is, um, and uh, have it make sense as part of a continuum of Xbox ecosystem products and services, where uh, console becomes less and less over time, as I've, <laughs> I've always argued, and they literally make that case, the percentage of revenues derived from Xbox consoles, they predict, will go down over time because, duh. And the percentage of revenues they get from things like um, software and services, which is, you know, game sales and uh, in-app purchases and blah, 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 it's going to go up. And uh, But this requires them to basically double their revenues over a 10-year period. And uh, I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm not. But that requires investment. It requires all that stuff happening in Azure. It requires putting Xbox Series X machines and data centers and 27 of their 57 Azure uh, locations or whatever it is, or territories or whatever the term is, um, is all kinds of stuff. It's big. So I, I, you know, to me, this is rather incredible. Um, and, you know, you transition to um, what you transition to elsewhere in the company. The thing, honestly, that started in the late 1990s with software assurance and volume licensing, which is basically monthly subscription, regular revenue rather than big bop releases every five to eight years on console and occasional big releases on the software side from, you know, some of the bigger game titles. Um, you just turn it into more of a smooth path, you know, hopefully going up, but not big spikes and valleys, but just something, uh, you know, a better, uh, healthier business, um, which, you know, a lot of people like me and normal people who are paying 1800 subscription fees every month might complain about, but also recognize this is the world, right? Were there any surprises in here or, I mean, this all kind of Love. makes Oh, really? Okay. I, yeah, yeah, no, there are surprises. I mean, I, it's, it's kind it's, of makes um, sense. I mean, I, there's some deep, we didn't know the specifics, but this seems yep. like, you know, a cease, yeah. reasonable plan. Yeah. Yeah. I, they, they allude to some things I want the details on. I've, I've made the case, for example, that Xbox is not profitable, right? Right. Uh, Phil Spencer on at least two occasions I found so far has uh, sort of mentioned this in internal emails. And uh, he doesn't say, as you know, Xbox is not uh, profitable. What he says is, as you know, we have received some pressures from the board about the profitability. <laughs> and, and, you know, like, I, you so, guys have been I, bitching uh, at us and uh, yeah, we, here's yeah, yeah. our so, response. I mean, you know, I like to see things that uh, confirm or, or, you know, even debunk, whatever. I just want to see the truth. Right. So I don't really care. Do you but, think the whole thing was a board presentation that leaked out? Uh, no, it's not a board presentation, but a, a lot of it consists of board presentations. Right. Like this thing, these images we're looking at are from a board presentation. Right. Okay. Um, a presentation to the board of directors of Microsoft, like, you right. know, in other words, right? Because, you know, this is, uh, we talked about uh, Sanofsky and Surface. I mean, for, for that product to come to market, they had to get the sign off of not just the CEO, but the board. Right. And that was denied several times, right? Uh, it was only after both Sanofsky and uh, Balmer made an impassioned appeal to the board of directors that that was allowed to happen. So, you know, they they wield that kind of power. That's the you know, part and of the point. And the good news is that you don't lie to the board of directors. So anything, no, no, you don't. Anything in no. this is probably well. Th know, this is we're doing the right thing accurate. financially for the company, yeah. right? And and really the right thing, I think, is the way we would right, say it. Right. Uh, for the company and for you know and the company being a publicly owned entity with shareholders right? right that's the that's the point of it um 
there is a, one thing there's uh, I've only gone through a few I've only written up a few of these I'm trying to find these themes that I can pull out you know and, and turn it into a article right so I wrote about the uh, the thing we just talked about this uh, achieve industry leadership I just thought it was so beautiful um, and God God love you reaching for the stars like that but um, also Microsoft's reaction internally to the PS5 uh, reveal is very interesting the the timing on this is interesting because. You know, Microsoft and Sony announced their now current generation consoles at kind of the same time. They came out with their specifications within two days of each other. Um, Sony came second, and the big their so. the specifications, by the way, almost completely identical. You got to remember, Microsoft hid the Xbox Series S from the world, and based on what I'm seeing so far, and I think from the board of directors, until very late in the game. So. All we had was the X and the PS5. We didn't know about two PS5 models yet either. Um, and then they played a game of chicken with pricing because neither one of them wanted to come out first on the price, you know. But uh, And that lasted for several months. But the one thing that Sony came out that was dramatically better than the Xbox was the um, uh, IO bandwidth. And it was bad, like really bad. And uh, so Microsoft, um, I don't know, three, four months later, announced something called direct storage, which allowed them to keep up with the Sony um, IO bandwidth. And I don't, I'm not, I don't know if this was always planned, but I can tell you that when they were discussing this problem before they announced direct storage, no one mentioned direct storage, you know, no one said internally, he, 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 don't worry about it. We have direct storage. Like, so I'm kind of curious if that was supposed to come out later, <laughs> you know, and they were like, we got to rush this to market because we need it. Um, Sony literally made the promise. There will be no loading screens. They said this explicitly. Um, people now applied that quote to Microsoft. I don't know that they ever said that but the idea was this storage should be fast enough that no matter what's loading it just happens and we just start playing and honestly that's not the case on xbox for sure yeah um so their reaction anyway their uh, the internal reaction and this is people like phil spencer not uh, sachin nadell is all over this stuff um and then other people on the xbox team also uh, a woman who's on the board of directors um <clears throat> uh, were quite happy after sony announced what they announced because in their view they were neck and neck and everything's great. And this was important because they got destroyed in the previous generation. And they were thinking we can come out and um, we'll be neck and neck and we'll be, we'll be in good shape. Now, unfortunately, uh, history has shown otherwise. And it's not clear how Sony has pulled ahead so dramatically. Um, both companies faced component shortages. Obviously, that was an issue that was coming up right at about this time. Um, I, Sony, I feel like they handled that better. I don't know what that means. I don't know how they did it, but they, they had a better, they seem to have a better handle on supply. They both came out at the same price. Although, um, you know, Microsoft obviously has that cheaper version of the console. That's less powerful, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a funny moment though, after this back and forth, these executives are all talking about, it. everyone feels really good about it. Phil Spencer literally came out and said, let me see if I can find this. He says, uh, I don't know what Um, now, where is this? Uh, da, 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 da. We have a better product than Sony does. I know I shouldn't say this, but I can't help myself. We've all <laughs> lived with seven years of, of defeat, basically. By um, the way, I would not I, agree with that, obviously. I, you know. No, this was that day. They got to remember this yeah. before these products happened. Oh, oh right? okay. Okay. So, so everyone's he going back and forth. Yet. No, they've, they've seen the specs. So they're like, oh, thank right. God. We're, we're fine. We're, we're going to be fine. Yeah. So, uh, so, and I, I don't know how you get where better out of the specs, honestly, where I would say they were neck and neck is what it looked like, but, uh, except for a couple of things where, by the way, Sony was ahead, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> after all this conversation, Sacha Dadilla chimes in with, um, two sentences. He says, this is really great to hear, Phil. Neither of us has announced pricing, right? <laughs> like he didn't even know. He didn't know. And it's like, uh, no, we didn't. And that wouldn't come for many months actually. Um. And then uh, that email was uh, sent from mail for Windows 10, it says. Uh, so he was using that piece of crap <laughs> mail program on Windows 10. It was amazing. The, you know, the most powerful person at Microsoft. Um, <clears throat> so that one's funny. Um, one I haven't written about yet, but I, we, I think we should discuss is very interesting. Uh, and the timing of this is very interesting, is Microsoft, at the time in which they were talking about making that deal with TikTok, right? And outside of the company, everyone was like, what are you doing? Like, what, what on earth? does this have to do with anything? Right. So the argument that they made internally, which may or may not have been the argument they made externally, right? I, I honestly don't, I def, I'm going to go back and look this up before I write about this, but I, I, I will never, I, I just don't understand the TikTok thing, but here's the argument they made internally. 
Um, they needed a strong uh, consumer play, and they felt like this was a great example of a modern, popular online service that was just going gangbusters with, um, you know, younger people. And um, so uh, I don't know off the top, I don't know, it doesn't matter who said this. So someone, uh, possibly a board member or a, I'll, I'm going to look, at, I don't want to say what it is, it doesn't matter. But anyway, this guy went to town on this. He's like, I'm sorry, this is the stupidest thing I've ever heard, you know, blah, 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 this, blah, blah, blah. He says, you know what? We have been a consistent number two in gaming. We have a strong franchise. We're making the shift to the cloud where Microsoft has this huge strength, maybe immersive MR, VR over time. We'll see. Why don't we buy Nintendo? Let's buy Nintendo. That got a lot of attention. Yeah. So this is what's amazing. Now, this is a person we both know. Chris Capicella wrote back after a couple of emails. He says to this person, I totally agree that Nintendo is the, all caps, prime asset for us in gaming. And our most likely path to consumer rel relevance. Wow. I've had numerous conversations with the leadership team at Nintendo about tighter collaboration. And I feel that if any U.S. company would have a chance with them, we are probably in the best position. The problem is Nintendo has a lot of money <laughs> and, they're, oh, and they're not for sale, right? Um, so, but they, you know, interesting. So at this time, they had uh, two fairly active merger and acquisition discussions going on. Warner Brothers Interactive, which I'm not sure I'd ever heard about, and ZeniMax. Now, they bought ZeniMax, right? ZeniMax is the Bethesda company. They own, you know, Doom and all the id stuff and, all, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So they did buy ZeniMax. Yes. But then at the end of this email, he says, I love this discussion. Uh, looking at opportunities, blah, blah, blah. Nintendo would be a, uh, oh, actually, that's Phil. I'm sorry. Oh, that's Phil saying I totally agree. I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. That was, that was from Phil Spencer. I'm sorry. Um, not, not Chris Cap, sorry. Um, he says, uh, blah, blah, blah. oh, no, it's, oh, so it's Chris Cap who later says, sorry. Um, I'm not going to outfill on the list of possible gaming acquisitions. Now, remember, this this dates back, I'm sorry, this is from 2020, uh, that we've shared with the board. But I will say we are focused on great content companies that would help us improve Game Pass, deepen our PC and mobile content, and help us in regions in the world where Xbox has had less success to date. There have been lots of rumors so he's not really saying anything, right? Uh, of Microsoft being in talks with a variety of content players like Warner Brothers, EA, et cetera. <laughs> right. Yep. Meaning Activision Blizzard. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, that's, and that's what came out of that. Et cetera. Right? Yeah. They're yeah. the et cetera. Did, if any, Microsoft did anybody owned... mention in any of these memos regulate regulatory issues with these acquisitions? <laughs> if Microsoft well, bought Nintendo, I think you'd, you'd definitely see some. So if heat. Activision Blizzard had never happened, if ZeniMax had never happened, right? right? Microsoft trying to buy Nintendo, assuming, you know, that somehow that becomes possible, uh, would have received the same exact regulatory scrutiny as Activision Blizzard did. That's my, my yes, guess. I it agree. would have been this horrible. Yeah. Um, in the wake of Activision Blizzard, this is never happening, right? This, we just need to be honest about this. There is no chance on earth no. of them buying no. act, of them buying no, Nintendo. No, no. no, no. I, I don't think there was, realistically, I don't, you know, Nintendo has never really been for sale. Per se, right? I mean, they're, and they're doing great, honestly. I imagine um, these kinds of discussions happen a lot in, in corporations, and it's just fantasy role playing. It's not. Well, people talk, you know. Yeah. Uh, these it's all these upper level executives I mean, know everyone. Well, I've, and, I've, you know, talked with Lisa about buying CNN, and uh, I think if it continues so, <laughs> to go downhill, maybe we'll have a shot at it. I don't know. So I, uh, I made a joke about this on uh, on Twitter, and uh, it was based on this quote where he said, um, "Let me see if I can find this." Uh, <laughs> it's my favorite favorite quote of the year if i can find it microsoft phil spencer says that acquiring nintendo would be a career moment to which i said that would be me like acquiring def leopard because i like the music <laughs> it's a career moment for paul theron yeah, it would be a career moment it's like guys what are you doing play a song i didn't play, i own you, you know? man i own you yeah let's go let's go Hysteria. put some sugar on me baby right come on back right now <laughs> yeah, exactly <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, it's a dream. I mean, it's a, it's a dream. It's a, yeah. it's a fantasy. Yeah. Sure. I think what he, you know, honestly, I, the, the message behind that statement, however, is, is a very positive one. And it is, I think, the Phil Spencer legacy and, 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 and why this guy is so great compared to so many of the people who might otherwise be in his position, which is this. He really doesn't want there to be exclusives. He really doesn't want it to be us against them. He really wants games to be every, he's a gamer. I want 
my games to be everywhere. I want your games to be everywhere. He wants everyone to partner and do the Kumbaya moment. And all. He really wants this. And when he says, you know, the career moment with Nintendo, I think what he's really saying is any link up with Nintendo, anything we could do with them, any way we could be more important to each other and benefit our collective audiences is a win. And I honestly, I think that's his greatest. I think that's what's, that's Phil Spencer. I just think he's amazing. So, you know, there's a lot more that in this. Um, I will, like I said, over the next week, I'm going to write more of this. So I think I, I suspect we'll go over a few, at least a few things next week too, um, because I'm trying to pull things, so many documents, right? So I'm trying to pull things together and find these themes. And every once in a while, you know, like the, um, uh, the consumer thing, that I'll be writing next is uh, Nintendo's part of it, but they, they they talk about consumer and Microsoft and consumer is a big debate uh, that happens in our community. Um, Microsoft doesn't do very well with, with consumer overall. Um, they used to make big initiatives in the consumer space, especially back in the early 2000s. They don't really anymore other than Xbox. Some people think they should just get out of this business still. They should just you know admit it. They're just an enterprise company. They're an infrastructure. Some people say, no, you can make a huge play here. You know, the total addressable market of this is in the hundreds of billions per year. Um, if every, you know, we talked about every percentage point, remember, of um, usage share with um, web search is like a billion bucks a year. Um, wow. the, the, the numbers are pretty similar in this space. I mean, it's, uh, if they could move up, like if they owned Activision last year, they would have been the third biggest company in the world, right? Uh, gaming company. If they had owned Nintendo last year, they would have been first. <laughs> you know, yeah. So it, it, there are things can shift uh, the market. So, you know, we'll see. Very interesting. I can't think of anything. You know, I talked about that Surface leak, right? For me, that was kind of a big deal. I I had a there was a Microsoft event in the long run time frame called Envision. I got an internal event. I got a total like an incredible dump of stuff. To me, that was incredible. That was probably my personal biggest moment was the uh, Longhorn stuff. But the uh, as far as Microsoft in general. This might be the biggest one. I mean, uh, the NT source code leaked at one point, remember? Uh, yeah, but that, you know. Yeah, no, this, I mean, is, this, is, this is current. That's what's, I think, significant. No, I know, it's it's if, a blockbuster. Yeah, the NT source code was 20 years old. If this, if, if. Uh, well, I, yeah, I mean, there was a leak that happened. Oh, back in the day. They had switched over oh, to okay. 2000 and XP okay. or whatever. But it was okay. still, you know, it was still, you know, Microsoft, uh, I, I'm not saying this is a direct correlation, but Microsoft started sharing the source code with uh, partners and governments after that. And uh, I think that was why, right. <laughs> you know, right. I actually do think that was why, I mean, they, you can make all your positive announcement points, but I, I really think that was the, the point. Uh, let's take a break. And uh, there's still more to come. <laughs> the big AI event yeah. tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, Amazon had their event today and said they're putting okay. AI into echo. As long as Echo doesn't start saying it's pumped, I'm I'm I'll be okay. <laughs> well, that was the thing. I, I I really enjoy these Amazon events, and I'm thinking to myself, is next year, is it going to be him? Is it going to be Panos like, next year? Is oh, this going to get weird? Don't do it. Don't just don't do it. No. I I didn't get to see it. You saw it, so I I will mm -hmm. ask you about that. But also the AI event from Microsoft tomorrow, and we got a Surface mm -hmm. event coming up. Oh no, that don't call it a Surface event. It's not a Surface event. <laughs> It's yeah, an AI we'll event, but there may be with it. Well, let's see. We'll find out. Will there be hardware? We will find out. We yeah. will find out. But first, a word from our sponsor, Miro. M-I-R-O. Uh, science has told us, and it explained a lot, that when you uh, get up from your seat to go get a cup of tea and you go through a door and you arrive in the other room and you go, what did I get up for? That is normal. It happens to everybody. And science believes the reason is it's called a context switch. Going through that door tells your brain, pop the stack, we got a new context, we're going to start over, and whatever was in there went out. Now, you know that happens, and it happens at work, too. If you're working on something exciting and you have to switch from tab to tab in your browser or from one app to another or copy it from Slack and paste it into Docs and... It just, uh, you're losing stuff all the time. It f the wheels are coming off as you go. With Miro, that doesn't have to happen. Miro is a collaborative visual platform that brings all your great work together, no matter where you are, no matter what tools you use. Because it integrates with so many tools, including, yes, Slack, Zapier, Google Docs. Whether you're working from home or in a hybrid workspace, 
everything comes together in one workspace and it's all online and it's a central source of truth that solves another problem because nowadays we've got teams working in multiple locations multiple time zones and so having a single place where everyone can go and say this is where we are this is what we're doing is hugely powerful creating the one great product as an example needs input from everywhere everybody's got to kind of weigh in right and that's where miro comes in because it it, it can it can democratize collaboration and input Miro's infinite shared boards give product teams a perpetual space where they can just drag and drop insights, data. Nothing is ever lost. Nothing is ever forgotten. Miro covers every possible use case, by the way. So you can build visual assets. Yeah, it's very visual. It's just nice. You can present findings, right? You can run brainstorms with cross-functional teams. You can build out your product vision on a Miro board brainstorming with Whatever works for you, sticky notes, comments, live reactions, there's a voting tool. You'll love the fact that when you're on a, on a, on a meeting, in a meeting, uh, they've got a timer. Make sure you come to consensus quickly. Icebreakers, they've got so many great tools. You can express yourself in creative ways and bring the whole group together around one idea. Wireframes. Uh, you can draw. There's a pen tool. Um, you can... You could do a mood board kind of thing, you know, cutting, you know, and pasting images. You could do mock-ups on the Miro board. Users of Miro report saving up to 80 hours per user per year. That's two weeks of vacation every year for every user just by streamlining conversations and cutting down meetings. I think I believe that. The end result, Miro gives your team the chance to always stay connected to real-time information a single source of truth that gives project managers and product leads a bird's eye view of the whole project. Nothing slips through. You can zoom in and see the deets, zoom out, see the 30,000 foot level, and it's all there. No matter, no matter more than a million people use Miro every single month. You should be using it. And I forgot, I buried the lead. You can get your first three boards free right now. So you can try it free. When you're in the Miro website, too, look at the Miro verse and all the templates, the things people are doing with it. It's mind boggling. It's incredible. It's beautiful. It's powerful. Miro, start working better. Go to M I R O dot com slash podcast. Miro dot com slash podcast. Get your first three boards for free and uh, get creating. It's an awesome tool. Thank you, Miro, for uh, supporting Windows Weekly and Mr. P. Therat. So Hello. tomorrow's a big day. We will not be streaming it live because they're not streaming it live. <laughs> right. But people will be able to watch it in the afternoon after the event's over. Mm -hmm. And I believe we can uh, post pictures and even videos. Oh, from so go there to therot.com and watch the, you'll do a, you'll do a kind of a live. Yeah. Live blog. I'm hoping to, yeah, we're trying, we're, right now there are people racing to implement a <laughs> kind of a live blogging thing on the Good. site. Right. Uh, so I hope to be able to do that on the site tomorrow, but I'll do something either way. Um, so the, the thing that's most interesting about this is, um, this event was the way it kind of was communicated. So they reached out to people. We're going to have this special event in New York and people started saying, uh, Microsoft's having a surface event. <laughs> I was like, well, maybe, I mean, I, maybe it seems like there would be more than surface. In fact, back when that was the talk, remember I said, it can't just be surface. They don't really have much to say. It's got to be about windows and and the you know the ai stuff it's got to be this other stuff right so the second round of invites that had more detail they spelled out like you know the way they wrote it was this is going to be about ai across microsoft and they specified things like bing windows microsoft 365 and the you know, something like that so i said see this is not and sur actually surface was in the list so my thing was always like this is not a surface event this is an ai event and and really it's the next milestone in the ai push the one that began with bing in february Microsoft 365 Copilot, I think, in March, and then the build announcements, the Stevie Batiste three phase, uh, you know, stuff, et cetera, et cetera, from uh, May. And um, I wrote this huge editorial about it, and then uh, an internal memo leaked, and that's exactly what they're doing. <laughs> so I was right about that. That's nice. But um, uh, the memo internally from Yusuf Mehdi, who now runs Windows, by the way, uh, says we will show the next steps we'll take to further uh, building on our AI work and lead in this exciting area, era, blah, blah, blah. Um, we're going to keep the news confidential until we share it with the world later this week, but I will lay out the vision for what's ahead. And that's it, it, literally the, how I wrote it. In fact, the way I wrote it was 
Well, I wrote, I basically just wrote static. Doesn't matter. Microsoft's goal is to spread AI across its various products and services quickly and seamlessly. And then, and then I think this is the key bit, ramp up the addition of regular new features across the board, just like it did with Microsoft Teams, right? But now not just for one individual product or service, but across the ecosystem. And the key to that is this open standard for plugins that they talked about, I think at Build, where they are going to um, integrate or, or use the same plugin model across the co-pilots, chat GPT with open uh, AI and um, Bing, right? And this is what, you know, this is what I was talking about. So when you think about um, what they've announced so far, the, the Bing stuff is clear cut, right? Uh, like it or not, it doesn't matter, but you have this chat bot you can, in, you know, interact with on the web. You can ask it complex questions, keep a conversation going, learn more, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And there's this absolutely value to that. Um, if you use it through the, they've integrated it into Microsoft Edge. And if you use uh, the Bing functionality in the Edge sidebar now, they added an image creator function, which you can also get it. I think it's bing.com slash creator or create or creator, um, which is similar to Dolly and those other products, right? Um, draw me a picture of a pink unicorn flying in space, you know, whatever it is. Um, so that's neat. And, you know, and then they've been adding, I mean, ever since this announcement, adding features, expanding access, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of stuff going on there. Microsoft 365 Copilot, very well understood. They were very detailed about their plans for that. Um, Windows Copilot, uh, uh, not so much, right? I mean, this is right, the way they announced it looked like kind of light on features. Um, the way it is in preview today, very light on features. So you get all the Bing stuff, right? The Bing chatbots in there. But as far as using it to control Windows features or, or figure out how to use Windows features, a little lackluster. Um, and so... I've been kind of waiting for some next event where this would get better, right? And I think this is it. I think this plugin model is going to allow uh, Microsoft and third parties to increase the capabilities of all of these. These things are all co-pilots. Um, uh, they don't use that terminology in Bing. Uh, Bing, that feature is called Bing Chat. But internally and um, obviously externally, you can see it really, it's a co-pilot. And Stevie Batish explicitly referred to it as a co-pilot in his talk. If you go back and watch or listen to that. I remember that. Um, yeah. So there's, I can hear a crowd. <laughs> really? You hear a crowd? Oh, because oh, Richard's here. Oh, Richard's here? Sorry to complicate works, but we got in a little early. <laughs> We're thrilled. There is Richard Campbell. Where are you, Richard? Uh Air New Zealand Lounge in Auckland, lay over for my flight to Sydney. All right. Well, hello, Auckland. Oh, what time? We wait, were technically wait. both right. Is He's it tomorrow? To both Australia and New Zealand. Yeah. Is it? What where, What time is oh, it? it's Thursday here. And by the way, the AI event was amazing. Well, we're going to get that double box up and you and Paul can, uh, can talk about it. We've already talked to well that's right he's seen the whole thing already he can tell us what they're gonna say uh we're uh <laughs> we're uh we is that just, how time works no <laughs> i'm not sure we're uh we're uh just we finished uh the panos panay talk we finished the uh the memo leak Xbox talk leak, yeah. and we're on to the uh, ai event but richard if you have any thoughts about the yeah. the, the former Please. Yeah, I mean, have you heard anything about Panos Panay, for example? I mean, I mean nothing I, new. You and I had a chat yesterday or the day before yeah. about this. Like, you know as much as I know. It's interesting. It obviously was sudden. It obviously was. Uh, I think he blindsided Microsoft because he was the body publicly about being part of the event. So I don't know how that's friendly. Thing. I was that. I, okay. I will say uh, the one thing that was in the back of my mind was... They're not really, uh, for, I was saying earlier, you know, a lot of people were like, oh, it's a Surface event. I'm like, I, it's not a Surface event. I mean, Surface is a part of it, but honestly, in the scope of things, it's kind of the smallest part of it. And um, I was wondering about his participation in this because I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm well, wondering. Like realistically, if, how does Microsoft do anything other than AI events these days? Right. No, at least for the rest of the year. Right. How do they, at least for the rest of this generation, <laughs> I mean, this is it, right? I mean, I was saying earlier, you might appreciate this comparison. I think uh, thanks to this open plugin they're doing and uh, they're going to um, try to improve AI across the ecosystem in the same way 
that they improve teams very rapidly. I think there, there's going to be a similar initiative, you know? So I will say. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely an ecosystem play, but that's what Microsoft knows how to do. Right. So this is about harnessing as many people as possible to run on a gold rush. And, uh, and some of it's going to be great. And some of it's going to be terrible. <laughs> yes. Well, that, yeah. Um, we're going to, uh, if you thought it was bad that they started describing spell checking as AI, wait until everything is AI, which is actually an editorial I wrote several months ago as, as part of my seven stages of coping with this AI thing, which was if everything is AI, then nothing is AI, <laughs> you know? Um, so we'll see. But yeah, you're right. No, you definitely, uh, it's going to be a, a spectrum of, uh, capabilities, but you know, I was still, I interact my, uh, the people on my uh, site in the comments are going nuts right now because of all the stuff that's happening. But one of the b interesting debates is this topic. And I, I, I want people to, you know, we have to be able to separate the nonsense from the truly useful stuff and not miss the truly useful stuff because some of it is nonsense, <laughs> you know? Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. I'm very curious to see what happens, but I do think we're going to see, uh, and there was some, there was a leak by the way of a Yusuf Mehdi internal memo about this. He didn't get into any details, but yeah, you know, we're going to lay out the vision for the future of AI uh, at Microsoft. Right. And very specifically, I would say on what I think of as the client, even though a lot of this happens in the cloud, right. That it's the, uh, the stuff for individuals, like, uh, how this will improve the life of Microsoft's users you know, whatever they're using windows, Microsoft 365, Bing, uh, if you are, God help you, um, <laughs> or whatever else, you know, surface too. I mean, um, and I, Leo's gone, so I don't want him to miss this, but you know, everyone's wondering about surface. I mean, the rumors suggest we're going to get three very minor upgrades. Only one of them is in a class that a professional would consider buying or using. <laughs> And that's uh, Surface Laptop Studio 2, which I assume would be on your short list. Based on, this is just rumors, but based on the, the rumor about that particular machine. Um, let me see if I can find the exact quote here. Da, 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 I, can, I guess, not, I don't know. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's not next gen. Now, that said, um, Intel just announced uh, Meteor Lake at kind of a an off time, right? Me Meteor Lake being... Uh, what would have been the 14th gen Intel core. They're now calling them something like uh, ultra, core ultra, you know, where they're changing the branding. But typically we see the desktop chips in the fall and then we see the mobile chips in the spring. And uh, uh, actually in the very beginning of the year, at CS, right? That's the kind of normal time frame. Um, these things are not arriving until December 14th. I don't know off the top of my head if they're desktop and or mobile parts, right? But if they are, if they are desktop, there will be a mobile version as well. A little, if that's true, I wonder if the mobile versions might be a little bit behind as well. And it's so like Microsoft and Surface to announce new computers on the verge of a new generation release of processors. <laughs> you know, like it's just very typical. Well, I think everybody thought cycle between production right. problems full stop and the entire global pipeline being kept up like e, you know well i mean unfortunately in some ways they've always been behind um well almost always i mean i don't know i i, I don't know i mean that's just, I, I don't know how to expand on that <laughs> i just I mean, the claim, and the claim to fame for meteor lake is some kind of quote-unquote ai dip. right um i heard and i i think you might have heard separately but um that MPUs are coming to all surface computers, supposedly like this was a, this was a big message earlier in the year. Um, I, I mean, I, if they release <laughs> new computers at an AI event and don't have MPUs, uh, th that tells me a, a few things, but it tells me they're going to have to talk about their intention for this to be a feature of a coming generation. So they, they, they can't <laughs> announce these computers at an AI event with no AI capabilities. Right. Um, so I'm curious, uh, we will see. Speaking of which, um, we went through a bit of the, um, uh, the Xbox leak, right. And it's massive and it's hard, uh, to kind of conceptualize all of it. I mean, some high level items that are very easy to understand, like a next gen console or whatever, but I'm trying to pull these kind of themes out from multiple documents. And one of them, by the way, is arm, um, as of. May, 2022, I believe, or sometime in 2022. And by now would have had to have been decided. In fact, they would have been designing the ships by now. 
the leading they were trying they were looking at and their lead choice for CPU on the next gen Xbox is uh, an ARM CPU um, that would be designed or co-designed with AMD. And, and I think uh, that's a great idea as long as it can emulate the Intel chipset fast enough. Okay. So I'm going to ask you what you think the definition of a term is because I have my own idea because <laughs> this is how they described it. But first, well, let me just ask you this. So you know, the term they used was forward compatible. <laughs> so what do you think that means? That forward, means not compatible. backward compatible. Thank you. That's, that's a very, you're right. It's a, it's a, it's a friendly way of saying not backward compatible. So they're going to forget about that issue, I think. And my guess is because this thing's not supposed to come out or, as of last year, wasn't supposed to come out until 2028 is that they would solve the backward compatibility problem by streaming. Yeah. Okay. Cause speed line is not going to get better in 2028, right? Like I'm still going to have the same basic issue with streaming the game. Well, okay. So I, I you're right. I, but I, uh, to that point though, so other parts of this leak include a direct connected controller to the cloud, which is what Stadia did and Luna does, right. Which helps reduce the latency. Obviously, at that time, five, six years, whatever, we'll go buy better connections, et cetera. Um, yeah, I mean, you're right. But I mean, I, I, it, I'm if they go with a, a forward compatible uh, platform, um, they do have this cloud streaming. I'm just, I, all I can think is that's how they're going to handle that, right? I mean, that's how it looks to me. ARM is today on, on Windows on the verge of being relevant. Um, we're, you know, praying <laughs> to the new via gods that, uh, this will happen and happen soon. We'll see. Um, there, uh, part of these leaks has to do with the, uh, the transition of Xbox as a platform from a standalone separate console product that has nothing to do with windows to something where there's a shared, uh, infrastructure. And now this next generation version, it's all one platform. They say, um, there's, there was like a, 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 a like a lightweight uh, Windows thing called WinX that Panos Panay told Phil Spencer they could have and uh, you could work with. And this thing is, uh, this next console is described as kind of a hybrid uh, cloud uh, console. And I, you know, whatever the hell that means, but, um, but I, I. Well, and you can't th tell me they know what it's going to mean in 2028. There is, unfortunately, the, the most recent communication I found so far, uh, and I don't remember who said this, uh, someone asked about whether this was feasible and whether it would happen. And the basic answer, and again, I can't remember who said this, was uh, there's a lot of inertia on the x64 side, you know, the Intel slash AMD side. And uh, we'll see, <laughs> you know, and um, because they also have to get developers on board. Um, and we'll see, you know, I, the, the success or lack of success um of windows and novia and whatever i think is is going to play a role although actually that like i said that decision supposedly had to have been made by now um so we will see do you want to talk about the day i've been because obviously i'm going to see it from sydney so uh, let me just uh summarize the few things we've said so far about this event uh because i i wrote up a big thing like my expectations blah 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 which now have been confirmed by use of Medi internally so you know, people have been describing this as a surface event. I'm like, no, 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 this is an AI event, <laughs> right? This is going to be the next milestone in that continuum that included, you know, Bing chat back in January, Microsoft 365 Copilot, you probably know better than me, but I think in March, um, the build announcements, the Stevie Batiste three phase, three types of yeah. AI applications, right? That stuff. Uh, the Windows Copilot, um, this notion of an open standard for uh, plugins that will work across chat gpt and the co-pilots and bang i think which i um, love if we can recruit the companies to play ball i was going to ask you this like separately but since you're here i will just ask you what you think of this idea that i have this stupid thing that came out of my brain which is that i believe my thought is no, no one said this i just sort of think I, I it makes sense to me because you look at windows copilot it's it's kind of half realized right now right mm -hmm. um the plugins will help th more features from microsoft will help but what really they need to do is just really push on it and i think they're going to add features to ai across the board where possible over the next year or two in a way that emulates what they did to improve teams over a similar time period where it went from 20 million to 300 million or whatever the figure is now users and um finally caught the attention of regulators. So, but when we started, it was a simple little chat based uh, collaboration solution. And when we ended, it was this crazy platform with tentacles of functionality going everywhere. And I think that's going to, that's going to be AI. It's going to start out simple. 
and it's going to well, get really full featured. The SBC International Biology Festival is a huge internal ecosystem that must be implemented. It has sort of a guaranteed set of customers. And it's a it's a clear value prop because they they can, and they've said this, they will charge extra to use those capabilities. Well, the biggest thing right. for me is, where is your personality? Where's the person that's going to, you know, with your, your Phil Spector type that's going to be out there on the Windows yeah. ecosystem? So and that person, it, right, it, you, you, you must have seen this news, right? <laughs> that person is use of Medi, right? Who, uh, if he didn't start in Windows, was in Windows when I met him in the late 1990s, mm-hmm. um, went from there to, you know, Windows Live, MSN, whatever they might have called it on any given day, went to Xbox for a long period of time and was most recently a Bing. He was the guy who did the Bing chat introduction in February. He's running yeah. Windows and Surface now. And this will be his play. Like, if you yeah. want to make your name in this company, this is a big play. Let me actually, I'm going to, I'm going to find a name and I'm going to throw, I want to see what you have to say about this. Um, so as part of this leadership change, Microsoft uh, will double down on its strategy and will build silicon systems and devices that span Windows, client, and cloud for an AI world. That team will be led by Pavan Davaluri who will report directly to Rajesh, or Raja, Rajesh, right? Whatever his name is. Rajesh Jha, sorry. Uh, a bunch of people will be working for him, including some key people we know from the Surface team, like Rolf Grohn and uh, Stevie Batish. Um, Windows planning and release management will continue to be in his team, I guess in that team. That's interesting. But so what does that mean? So, okay, maybe I misunderstood who's doing what here. So, uh, commitment to surface and MR, I guess, mixed MR, reality, mixed reality uh, yeah. remains unchanged. Um, so, very little support. Um, use of Medi will take on the responsibility of leading the Windows and Surface businesses with our OEM and retail partners. So, that suggests to me that he actually is going to report to this Pavan guy. Do you know him? Do you? Does that name ring any bells? Okay. So it might be him, it might be that person that is in fact going to lead this push that you were describing, right? Um, because it's AI across the company, right? So maybe that is actually the direct responsibility. So not use of many, I guess, uh, but, the, but rather this other person. It's an, it's an interesting group of folks. And let's say that Windows could use the gig of the band. That 11 was kind of an odd duck bird, and that now it's being cleaned up for enterprise and for being forced to it. Right. It's not a bad time to be talking about 12, and of course it has to be AI focused. That get the right people on the stage. You've got yeah. three or four of the most important Windows based software companies. Yeah, this, those companies, by nature, are recalcitrant. That's why they're still in play, right? Yeah. They are fundamentally troublemakers and, and <laughs> very focused on themselves. I mean, ultimately, the AI capabilities in, in Windows may be the least interesting in some ways, no matter what happens. All depends right? because, on who integrates. That's yeah. Everything. Well, that's what, but that's right. But yeah, but that's sort of what I mean. In other words, if Adobe integrates into it, I mean, in, in that instance, you're, you're using Adobe. There are examples of the three app modes that Stevie Batish mentioned that we yeah. already know about, which is fascinating to me. And I, I, you know, obviously the things that are named Copilot are very easy to um, understand. Those are the the copilot, those are the side by side. Well, and Stevie's you know. doing his job as tech, uh, as the tech developer, which is to go across those teams and to create these examples. Yeah, I mean, so the second application structure where AI is inside an app as the is mm-hmm. kind of the main scaffolding. One of the examples he used was ClipChamp, which is amazing because that's something I've been super involved with lately. Yeah. And the way he describes that uh, is absolutely accurate to that app. It's like you turn these very complex apps with pro level capabilities. And you turn them into what he, it's kind of weird, he said it, a one-click slider-driven intent, right? More intuitive interactions. You don't compromise the capabilities, but there are fewer toolbars, fewer deep menus. You just don't need them anymore. The final mode or whatever, the um, uh, the outside structure or whatever, this is the using AI as an orchestrator across multiple apps, plugins, and services. Yeah. Uh, something that acts like an agent, right? Something we were talking about in the very early days of .NET. Sure. Uh, .NET my server or hailstorm or whatever. Um, the interesting thing is I, I, when I started writing this article, I would, I kept coming back to this notion of how are you going to get this right? If you can't get file Explorer, right. And as I wrote that, I thought to myself, well, hold on a second. File Explorer is an interesting example of an application 
that has a plugin model, right? You install a zip app, you install a, a cloud services app, whatever it is, you know, you right click and you get things in the menu. Windows 11 hides those, by the way, which is really annoying, but they're there. They're still there. You can still get to them. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, you know, I wonder about this. And it turns out he said this explicitly, the Windows shell is an orchestrator. He says, in fact, it could be one of the most powerful orchestrators across apps, content, and the graph. Yeah. Um, you know, with AI, natural language, you see the opportunities there, blah, 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 whatever. But, um, you know, common plugin model from Windows, uh, Bing, Microsoft 365, etc. It is also Microsoft solution to being legislated against for any competitive practice. This is, I, that's great. I didn't th even think of that. But a week or two ago, I made the comment that, you know, Microsoft could uh, architecture inter uh, interactivity or integration uh, in, in Office in all kinds of ways, right? The way they did it with Teams was direct Teams integration. Here's a Teams feature in Outlook. Here's a team feature over here. But if you did that as a plugin model instead, which is what they're saying now they are going to do, by the way, um, they could have just plugged in Teams into these plugs. And that's, yes, you're 100, this is exactly right. And maybe, maybe this was um, influenced or inspired <laughs> by regulation and, sure. it, and it's the right way to do it. Yeah. Um, it, it, this is the browser model, right? I want to use windows, but I want to use Chrome. That's my choice. I want to use windows, but I want to use Adobe's AI for image manipulation or whatever it might be. That, if that's part of a plugin model, I used to ask why Microsoft didn't have a default, um, uh, digital assistant choice, right? Back when, Co when, uh, they added Cortana to windows, Amazon brought to windows. I said, well, you know. Let's make this an open model. And it never happened. And of course, you know, Cortana went away, whatever. But um, yeah, this is exactly the same thing, right? Only oh, anticipating here. Sooner or later, Brad Smith's going to need an olive branch for the EU and Windows Copilot can be that one. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, in Microsoft 365 Copilot too, because the same, you know, same deal. It's, 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 I like this because it's the right way, regardless of yeah. your stance on Microsoft has a monopoly or Microsoft abuses their power, or whatever yeah. it is. This is absolutely the right way to do this. Yeah, and, and it and it offers the most power. Like now, you can do the whole best in three. Plus, that that's how you would attract all the third parties, right? Yeah, I really appreciate your thoughts around Scott Kevin Scott trying to actually on the CTO role again. Have you like ever have you interviewed him? I have. I've been on his trip too. Okay, so he is, I like his podcast quite a bit. Um, I was supposed to interview him. I can't remember. I think it was right. I think it, the pandemic happened. It was right around that time. And uh, he but he's he's a, an almost shadowy figure, right? He he he's never really had a big public. Yeah, uh, I mean, presence. I don't know that it's his nature either. And he's a smart guy and all that kind of stuff. He owned a Commodore sixty four, so he can't be all bad. But no, no, he, he and, and he was and he's we call him a build. He's not a knacker. Like he has to work at it. Yes. And I think it was not coincidental we saw him at Build because I think he is playing a major role in getting Microsoft to do this AI pivot. And he's also playing a role, which is something, you know, again, I, before it was more behind the scenes kind of thing. And I, yeah. I in the notes, I kind of wrote it as the Ray Ozzy moment. You know, yeah. when, when you're at Microsoft and you're not a co-founder or you haven't been there for 25 years or whatever, this is, yeah, I, I spoke earlier in the show before you came about Phil Spencer, my love of Phil Spencer. And, yeah. and part of it is his every man thing. He's just a guy, but it's really his kind of open love of gaming and loving gaming so much that he, he doesn't want, you know, he doesn't want comp competition. He wants everything to work together, you know? Yeah. And he's kind of an interesting guy, but he's just a, um, I don't know, he's just different. And I, I, we need more of different, you know, we've had the, uh, we've done the middle-aged white guy thing for a long time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, but I, but we need, you know, new ideas, uh, younger people, new ways of looking at things. Um, I, I, this is the type of thing that is happening at Microsoft today, which I think is really positive. Um, Kevin Scott is a middle-aged white guy actually, but, um, <laughs> but yeah, being a little you know, older than that, but yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but still a, uh, you know, kind of a different perspective, different approach, different kind of person. And the very fact that he's uncomfortable on stage. In the same way that I uh, kind of despise Panos Spinney for that, I, it almost endears me to him. I, you know, uh, let's face it, that was Bill's superpower too. He was never yeah. comfortable at any time. Yeah, right, right. But yeah, that, right, okay. And that's maybe that is the point because with Bill Gates, and I would say this is true of um, uh, of Kevin Scott, and was absolutely not true of Panos Spinney. Um, there was substance there, right? And so it's like, um, 
you know, it's like, oh, he's really stumbling there. It's like, shh, shut up and listen. <laughs> you know, with Panos, it was always like, he's not, he's not saying anything anyway. You know, he's just not saying anything. And I, I we need more people like this who have something to say. They're yeah. smart guys, you know. So anyway, yeah, I'm curious. I, we'll see. I don't know if he's playing a role in tomorrow or not, but um, I hope he is. And uh, I expect, I think we're going to keep seeing more of him, you know, Ignite on and on. I think this is, he's he's come out. I hope so. <laughs> you know? um, he also happened to be right. He was heavily involved with getting open AI uh, mm -hmm. over to Agger. And uh, so this is him and reaping a bet he made picked up years ago. Yeah. And had clearly affected the entire outlet. And in some ways, Kevin Scott has suddenly got this win. Like, he's found a way forward for the company. The boss is now bet on it. Yep. Now it's up to him That's to parlay key. into what it can be. Right. right. Richard, we're going to let you go because uh, I know you have to go, and the sound is really uh, pretty poor. And we have to it's take a break. Awful. Yeah. But I okay. appreciate your doing the yeah. yeoman job of calling up. Hope you have a great time in New Zealand. Yeah, and I was, I was going to talk about old fashions, but you know what? I'll save it for another Save time. it. Save <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm sad. I may have been out drinking with some friends the other day, and we drank a lot of old fashions, and I thought, nice. i got to write about them. I think an old fashioned year segment old cocktail. next week will be wonderful. Something to look forward That'll to. That'll be the plan, and we'll do it from Sydney. Thank so you. Nice. Oh, you'll I be in Australia. Escape. Okay. I will be in Australia. Runnersradio.com, richardcampbell.net rocks. On his way from New, New Zealand to Australia, en route. <laughs> Thank you, Richard. Thanks, guys. All right. See you later. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. We're going to take a little break. When we come back, more Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Actually, <laughs> your punishment continues. If you want more Paul, you can get it as a member of Club Twit because Paul does a great show for our club, club members only, although we put a, occasionally, as a little teaser, we put some on the YouTube uh, called Hands on Windows. And uh, speaking of Clip Champ, that is the uh, topic for the last couple of episodes. The final Clip Champ, I think, is either this week or next. Really good in depth examination of this cool app. Micah Sargent does Hands on Macintosh. We have the Untitled Linux show. All of these are in club. We also have ad free versions of all the other shows, the public shows, like Windows Weekly. Uh, and you get all of that for $7 a month. But wait, there's more. You also get access to the Club Twit Discord and all sorts of wonderful events that happen in there. Uh, we're big fans of the Club uh, Twit uh, community manager, a guy named, you might know him, Ant Pruitt, does such a good job. Lou Maresca will be uh, his special guest on September 28th. Uh, then a fireside chat with John Scalzi. I saw Ant reading uh, Scalzi's latest to get ready for that. That's fun if you're sci-fi expert ants really done some good stuff with the sci-fi october 5th uh october 26th the fireside chat with anthony nielsen stacy's book club's coming up uh renee rich you'll be doing and ask me anything those are all club events you also get to chat with other club twit members three four five i think it's now six seven thousand strong in there uh what else do you get? You get the Twit Plus feed with stuff that happens before and after shows, things that don't make it into the shows. Seven bucks a month. Now, how much would you pay? Well, it's still seven bucks a month. Uh, Eighty-four dollars a year. There's family memberships. There's corporate memberships. If you're not yet a member, it helps us out immensely. We really appreciate it. Just go to twit.tv/clubtwit. Now more. Yeah, what's it gonna take to get you into this club? <laughs> just hand the doorman a five a, a fin a Remember, saw back um, a saw buck back back in the 1980s they used to be like crossover episodes of tv shows like yeah, um, yeah. simon and simon and magnum P. I always thought that was weird when, where does she wrote it's and, so you know, weird when you know uh angela yeah. lansbury shows up in hawaii that's weird i don't i don't want to see yep. that yeah oh you know i might i'm not saying i'm going to appear on the mac show per se i think talking. that'd be cool we're talking, we're talking. in that case that I'd like to see. You can I'm uh, crap all over the Mac. Crap all great. over it. <laughs> <laughs> Micah likes Windows, so I don't know. By the way, I want to thank him for I, doing I like, Windows. I like the last Mac week. plenty, and I love Mac. <laughs> so. And actually, I will not, just as another programming note, I will not be here next week. We're going to Green Bay to uh, see a Packers game Thursday night, so I'll miss <laughs> the shows next week again. I'm sorry. Uh, apologies. Mm -hmm. Uh the uh, Lisa says, don't tell anybody and it, that we are going to have a Club Twit meetup at the Hinterlands Brewery on Friday. So consider yourself not told. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> there have been rumors about such a thing. She's I can worried there are too many people would, will show up. And I'm. Yeah. Wow. That 
that I'm not too worried about that. I'm worried nobody will show up. So right, right. <laughs> maybe that's the difference yeah. between her and me. Uh, she's the eternal optimist. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so uh, I think Mike will be doing the show again next week. So thank you, Mike. But then I'll be I'll be back. In fact, I am going to be traveling again next month. But I will be doing the show from Rhode Island. Wow. With I hope better sound quality than. Um, Mr. Uh, Rich Rhode Island in, uh, is in, uh, sort of part Auckland. of the country. You should be yeah, fine. I should be all right. <laughs> all right, on we go with the show. <laughs> I've lost track. Where, yeah. where are because we? I, I'm going to blow through just a couple of final uh, AI-related stuff, right? Um, there, we already briefly discussed these MPU-powered Intel Core Ultra CPUs that are coming soon, right? Cool. Uh, and the kind of weirdness of the off-schedule announcement, and is this related to the Microsoft event? Is this related to maybe what Qualcomm might be announcing? We can only speculate. Um, Bing Chat got a couple of new mobile integrations, neither which is super important. But if you are a Microsoft Launcher fan, you now have Bing, a, a Bing Chat in your uh, search box, which is kind of cool. That's one of them. And then I think last week, or last week we talked about this uh, feature coming to, uh, to Paint, right? The Inbox app in Windows 11. For background removal and i mean what a weird kind of high level feature to add to such a simple app when there are all these other things it doesn't do that maybe would have been better ads first but this past week we learned that paint is also getting layers and transparency capabilities and what do these things all have in common well we would describe this kind of stuff today as ai i know people take umbrage at that i get it but i think that this is part of uh, the Windows push with AI, like uh, the Inbox apps also uh, adopting these one of three modes of uh, AI um, integration. And uh, this is one of the three. So um, you have an existing apps app, you're adding capabilities to it. They're AI based. I think this is an obvious, it's visual, it's obvious. And I think that, you know, not that it leaked, but uh, because this is insider pre uh, preview stuff, it had to kind of go out into the world. So they're not really talking about it in the context of this event tomorrow, but I bet they are tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, we shall see. Okay. Um, and now we're not going to we... stream that event because we can't, but you'll be there. You'll live blog it at thorot.com, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then if people want to watch it uh, uh, tomorrow at 1 uh, p.m. Eastern, Eastern yeah. they're going to put right. it on the site so you can stream it. And then obviously we'll talk about it next Wednesday. Yeah. Yep. I'll, I'll watch it and uh, then we can talk about it on Twitter as well. And yeah, the it's definitely, it's almost certainly going to be worth Watching. Yeah, I don't, sounds like it. I don't literally I'm, know. I don't know anything other than what I've spoken about. I'm um, just frankly disappointed they're not streaming it because we would absolutely I know. I do do a little goofy. cover it. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have not in the in the theme of Windows, which you may recall is part of the show title. Yes, I've heard that. Um, well, there isn't a lot going on this week directly other than, you know, tomorrow's uh, event. But um, there have been no major new builds released since the last time we spoke. Uh, there was actually one or two release preview builds uh, that don't mean anything, unfortunately. Um, there have been some app updates uh, in the Insider program. So Windows Photos is also getting AI capabilities. Shocker, right? Background removal. I bet there's going to be more. Um, Snipping Tool and Phone Link are getting some minor updates. Um, nothing, nothing major there. But, you know, it's interesting to see Microsoft finally making... Um, up, you know, updates to inbox apps. I mean, this is something that actually languished for a long time. And I think, you know, every build, it's like one little thing. You're like, what, what's the big deal? But I think collectively, as you move between Windows 11 versions, it's starting to, it's starting to add up. It's starting to look kind of interesting. And then uh, I was getting prepared to write this big article, like editorial about Chrome OS and Chromebooks and, and the Achilles heel here. And, you know, my sister is a teacher. And one of the things I was talking to her about over the um, uh, Labor Day weekend is this notion that, you know, these institutions are cash strapped. Yeah. And they are going to Chromebooks for two reasons. Uh, one is, no, for one reason, it's cost, right? They're cheap, but they're cheap in ways that I don't think people understand. Um, people in the Microsoft space, oh, well, you know, we use PCs. It's like, no, you, the thing about Chromebooks is they figured out a management scheme that most teachers can kind of handle themselves with little or no IT staff. And that's another way you save lots of money. Um, the Microsoft approach is a lot more complex and expensive. The Achilles heel, however, is the life cycle, right? So Chromebooks, uh, depending on the Chromebook, depending on when they're released, uh, are, are not supported for very long. So what's started to happen at schools, including my sister's, is that they go this route, they, um, they go all Google, 
and then four years go by or yeah, five or whatever, like, and oh, they have man. they have this pile of Chromebooks they can't even resell because they're not supported anymore. My so, my Google, daughter has and loves the the Google Pixel Book, and right. it's going to well, be out nice, of that's a nice one. It's a beaut. It's an <laughs> yeah. i5. It's yeah. got lots of yeah. sixteen gigs of RAM. It's a nice. It's a PC. Right. It will go out of support in March, and she says, "What so, should I do?" Yeah, so I think for her, she I think she might be okay. I'm not I'm not as fully up on what Google is doing across the board, but I, I do know that Google is working to separate Chrome from Chrome OS, which I know sounds goofy, but that would allow the browser to be updated with security updates. That would be enough. For. That would be sufficient. Yeah, so that that's that will help existing users. Yeah. What they're doing for new customers, because you know, again, schools these things pile up. Like imagine you went with like MacBooks or uh laptops or Windows laptops. And five years go by, whatever amount of years, and you're like, all right, we're done with these. Um, we are moving on. And you, you could sell them. Like, you could actually earn a little bit of money off of that sale and help, you know, fund the new things. With the Chromebooks, they just go out of date, whether you want them to or not. Mm -hmm. And now they're worth zero. So mm -hmm. they go to landfills. Mm -hmm. And the school actually has to pay to recycle them otherwise. It's a, it's a huge problem. So Google announced, uh, I think it was last week, that they're expanding the lifespan of Chromebooks. Uh, to 10 years of automatic software updates huge, starting huge, next year. Huge. And, yes. This is um they've real uh, this is the, what they should have always done frankly. This is the um this kind of solves the problem. It's not going to hit on everyone's computers, right? So there's, there's some asterisks here. Um Chromebooks released since 2021 will uh get security updates, right? Part of the problem is that the Chrome web browser and the Chrome OS are in fact integrated. This is like what Microsoft did right with IE. Um and so they can't be updated separately, apparently. Um, but like I said, Google, I know Google's working on that. I, th that may help with this problem. Um, for people with Chromebooks older than 2021, it's, it's still going to be a little bit of a problem, right? So that, I mean, it, it's not a, it's not a bandaid that fixes every problem, but it fixes it going forward and it fixes it retroactively for the past, uh, three years or two, well, at that point, three years. So I think it's big. And I, you know, and the reason I mention this is, this is a problem for Microsoft. Uh, they've struggled with in education in many ways, and one of the re the reasons are cost. And this was the one thing that they could. And I was gonna I was gonna make this case in this editorial. This is the thing that Microsoft should market. That there is the cost that you know, but there's this cost you don't understand. And actually, it may work out depending on the system you use and whatever. That the Microsoft side might be in fact cheaper over time. But now we uh, <laughs> can't say that anymore. So good for uh, Google, smart, uh, took too long, but you know, fine. Okay. Um, before today's, this week's blockbuster set of news, I think the big thing we were looking at <laughs> over the past couple of months was uh, some antitrust stuff. And uh, Microsoft was involved with that, with uh, the Slack complaint from several years ago, the EU looking into it, reports about Microsoft trying to make a concession and not working. And then finally, Microsoft just coming up publicly and saying, you know what, we're just going to nip this one in the bud and we're going to debundle Teams from Office. We're going to charge a little bit less for Office, not a lot less, by the way, a little less. And uh, we're going to let people uh, or companies really, right, buy Teams separately if they want it. And we're also going to do some of those integration bits we talked about a little bit when we were talking about AI, where there's going to be kind of a plug-in model in Office where other uh, competitors can plug in their products instead of, you know, so if you don't want to use Teams, you want to use Slack. Uh, some of those integration bits will appear across Office, right? So that was their solution. Honestly, I thought this sounded pretty good. But there was a report in Bloomberg saying that this is not enough and they are going to formally charge Microsoft with uh, antitrust violations in the form of a statement of objections because that's passive-aggressive the way they do things in EU. And um, we will see if and when that happens. This could take a couple of months, uh, but so we're going to be in a holding pattern for a little while. But of course, the question is, what's the problem, <laughs> right? And I have a theory, and it's based on the leaks we got, I think, over the summer and the spring about Microsoft's uh, behind-the-scenes attempt to mollify these regulators, which involved exactly what they said they were going to do, or at least the unbundling part. And the EU's answer to that, apparently, was it wasn't cheap enough, that Office without Teams should be significantly less expensive, not just $2 less per user per month. So there's probably some dollar amount where this makes sense. And I bet that dollar amount is how much Slack charges per month. Because <laughs> I because the problem is if you buy Office without Teams, you save $2 per month. You go to Slack. We're like, you know what? We want to use you instead. How much does that cost per month? 
And they'll say, depending on the size of your operation, they might say it's $6, it could be $8, it could be $10. It's not $2. So you will still pay more for Microsoft 365 plus Slack. And I think that's the problem. Of course, uh, forcing a, a company to charge the same price as a competitor is a little weird, but, uh, and we'll see. I, I'm just, I'm just guessing anyway, so that might not be it. But that's my guess. I think it's because um, it didn't uh, meet the pricing need. Which I have to say, I, I pointed that out at the time. That was the one thing I was like, eh, you know, I'm not sure if this solves the problem. Okay. Um, Surface event tomorrow. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Microsoft. Did we mention that? <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Microsoft is expected to announce three Surface products at the event. I don't think this is going to be a big deal in any way, shape, or form. I, if the, I think the point of having Surface at this event, aside from the fact that Surface tends to have a fall event, is uh, to talk about AI innovation coming to Surface in the future, right? Not in these devices, because they're not going to have any AI in, you know, innovation. Um, to date, the only thing that Microsoft's been able to talk about, God, do they talk about it a lot, is this Windows Studio Effect feature, a uh, set of features, which are things like background blur in a video call, that kind of thing, that require an MPU, uh, meaning today on Surface, they only work on the ARM-based version of mm. Surface Pro 9, mm -hmm. which nobody owns, right? So who cares? Um, but MPUs are coming, as we know, to the x86, well, x64 side of the family. Uh, they will not be in any of these computers. Uh, the only one that looks any decent is the Surface Studio 2. Uh, it will have exactly the same design as its predecessor, uh, which came out two years ago, by the way. So it hasn't been updated since then. Um, my understanding, we'll see what the CPU is. The, the trick is the CPU. So, um, we'll see. I, knowing Surface, um, 12th gen, you know, 13 gen, I don't know. Uh, but if it does have a meteor lake, uh, that would solve my complaint. I guess with this one computer, they could say this is the first one on that side of the family. We'll see. And then the other two laptops will absolutely have out of date processors and are not interesting and are not physically different from their predecessors and shouldn't matter to anyone listening wow. to the show. But so, uh, I know the I'm hell with sell it. <laughs> the 12.5 inch uh, Surface laptop Go 3, same design, blah, 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 12th gen chip in that case. Um, and then the Surface Go 4, which is the 10-inch tablet, um, you know, the, with the kickstand. Uh, Intel N200 CPU. Uh, I think that's code word for what used to be called Pentium or oh, something. Dear. You know, it's yeah. crap process. They, they did drop the Pentium name. They did, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, so ugh. so I hope there's more. I Maybe there is, you know. Um, well, you've cautioned I, like us. I said, this is not a Surface event anymore. It's an yeah, AI event. Yeah, it's not a Surface event. So yeah. Yeah, we'll see. Oh, well. Okay. But that, but that's happening, right? It's happening. Yeah. Um, Xbox, <laughs> we had a bunch of Xbox news before, but um, a sm just two small announcements. Um, it's We're in the second half of September, so now we're getting uh, a small list of Xbox Game Pass titles that are coming uh, now through the end of the month. Uh, none of these mean anything to me, uh, although Microsoft has been pimping something called Party Animals pretty hard. Um, oh, I can't wait. I know. <laughs> Uh, oh, the yeah. animals. Oh, so, less said about that. The Gotham better. Knights paid and, um, free and party animals. <laughs> Finally and then, here. <laughs> um, fulfilling a promise slash threat <laughs> that Phil Spencer made about two years ago. That future Bethesda games would be released on other consoles on a case by case basis. Uh, we now know, uh, according to one of those leaked documents, I guess, that uh, the Elder Scrolls VI, which was announced before Microsoft acquired uh, ZeniMax, which owns Bethesda, uh, would be released on PlayStation consoles, but now it will be an Xbox ecosystem exclusive. It will be on Ooh. PC as well as the Xbox consoles. Will it be right better now. because it's only on Xbox? I mean, I feel like that question answers itself, but um, <laughs> yes, obviously. Um, That's what I mean, it has an Xbox log. What are you talking about? It's going to come in a green box. That's what I don't even said about uh, Starfield is, oh, it's better because, you know, we didn't have yeah. to do a PlayStation 5 right. version. It's just I don't even understand this question, Leo. What are you talking yeah, about? It's just better that way. It's better for everybody. <laughs> yep. Just get an Xbox, you'll be happy. Not everybody. Um, okay, so that's that. I actually love the... Uh, you know, I, I was a big Skyrim fan, so I'm I'm looking forward to this Elder Scrolls Six. That'll be fun. Speaking of which, do we ever talk about this? Um, uh, Star Starfield, right, yeah. is a single player game. Do you not think that the future of this, like two three years down the road at most, we're going to see a multiplayer MMO, oh, yeah. whatever you want to call it, oh, version absolutely. of this, right? Like 
Isn't begging this the, for that. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That was a problem okay. in No Man's Sky was there were other people, but it was the universe is a big place. Yeah. It, it and you'd like, never run into yeah. them. It's like I, it's like I uh, a Stephen Wright joke, you know, I have a, like a map of the world, but it's uh, one to one scale. It takes me a long time to fold it up. You know, it's like like you're in the universe, literally, and it's like yeah. or like a George R. R. Martin. Space you know, it's like, I really is very I appreciate. Big. Yeah. He created his own world, and yeah. literally every single per person who lives in it is described in this book. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work. You know? <laughs> Uh, so, no, Starfield, it, it, unlike No Man's Sky, because you teleport through space, and I think it would be a great uh, multiplayer. I really do. I mean, it's, it's really Skyrim. Yeah, I mean, space. I think this it's is a multiplayer. I think this has to be what yeah, it becomes. Yeah. I'm sure they're intending and this, that. And this is actually where that uh, instant teleportation feature kind of starts to make sense because yes, it's the exactly. thing you were just talking about, right? You want to just exactly. jump to see other people. Yeah, I don't want to ride horses all day. No. <laughs> I know. Right. I mean, my my butt would hurt more sitting in this chair for that many hours than we'd on a horse. You know. I I'm very. I was very sad because something went wrong with my Starfield save, and uh, I can't. It just won't load. So I'm hoping mm. that the patches that they've put out uh, in last week will solve fix it. Yeah. I'm sad. I I I will say. I mean, uh, problems notwithstanding, uh, Microsoft does a terrific job in in the Xbox space of keeping their core like key apps or key games up to date yeah. or, and with new features and whatever yeah i i think they're going to do right by uh oh i'm sure they will this is the promise why you use a console instead of pc gaming is because it's the on pcs yeah. the onus is on you on the console yeah. in theory they do it all for you well it, that's been a bit and i i mean i'm not sure i can credit phil spencer exactly but honestly this has all happened since he's come on board it's, yeah it's a big thing yeah. it's good it's one of the benefits of the ecosystem cool we can skip right to the back of the book and your tip of the week, Mr. Thrott. Yeah, so this is tied to something I would have talked about last week, probably uh, this ongoing digital decluttering journey that I'm on. And and because of the successes I've had, kind of expanding it to other things over time. And one of those is something I've been wanting to do for a long, long time, which is consolidating and organizing my online accounts. And in this case, very specifically, um, I have Microsoft and Google accounts, both personal and business, right? And I have done such a terrible job of what I use for what, and it's it's starting to cause some problems, right? So when I moved to Thrott.com, uh, the company I was working for at the time was using uh, Google Workspace. And um, so th my Thrott.com domain is on work Google Workspace, which means my primary account is uh, Paul at Thrott.com, which is like me, right? My, literally my name is also my work account, and it means a lot of things, right? But uh, anyone who uses such a thing knows that when Google comes out with new services or new features for existing services, they often do not appear on the Google Workspace side. You can get it with a personal Gmail account, but not Workspace. Sometimes they come, sometimes they don't. Uh, but it's it's always been a little problem. But there's been like these things over time, uh, every once in a while, where the mixing of work and, and home has been kind of a problem for me. Um, I talked about moving my video um, archive up to YouTube and not just to YouTube, but to YouTube as a public like channel. And of course I use my paulthrott.com account for that. And then I'm like, look, I'm going to use this for my site. I mean, maybe this should be the official YouTube channel. And then I was like, I'll change the logo. I'll change the name. And, but I use this account for YouTube. I use it for YouTube music. And so I have the, I have the weirdness of I'm using YouTube music and there's a Thrott.com logo up in the corner and it says my identity <laughs> is Thrott.com. Oh. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to change this. That's and it's hard. Ideal. It's, yeah. it's hard. And I, I'm reminded of, I've looked, I've looked into this in the past. Uh, I've tried, I've made steps in the past to do this and I, I can, I could see very quickly why I stopped. It's hard, especially when you have what I had, have, which is terabytes and terabytes of data. So to give you one example, <laughs> um, uh, I'll talk about this within the app pick as well. Um, I have what I thought was 200 and I think it was 244 gigabytes of data in Google Photos. It turns out 470 gigabytes of data. And just moving that between um, like a, a workspace account and a Google account, like a Gmail account is, is it itself is difficult. There are ways, right? Well, I'll talk about that in the next bit. But um, just dealing with that amount of data is hard. If you bring it down to a computer and organize it in some way and you have your local collection and you want to move things together and then you got to get it back up into the cloud, this is a nightmare. So this is a really, um, this is a really hard thing. I think if I were going to start this over again, I would do this a little differently. Um, one thing that Google does support is, uh, I think it's called brand accounts, but they're like sub accounts. 
and I don't know if they work across the board, like email and calendar and stuff, but they work with YouTube and YouTube music. So for example, when I made the eternal spring account, um, I put that off of paulthrott.com, but it's, it's sub, it's a sub brand. It's like its own thing. So it has its own URLs and its own stuff and it's separate. And honestly, that's not a horrible uh, thing to do, but I will tell you, we talked about this when we were, when LastPass had their problems earlier this year and everyone was moving oh, to Bitwarden so to whatever else. Yeah. One of the hardest things though, at the end, so you go through the terribleness of it, right? And by the way, the data you have in an online account is about a million times bigger than the data you have in a, a password manager, right? It's obviously that data is important. It's sensitive, but it's still, it's a lot more data. So it's a lot harder to work with. Um, the scariest thing you have to do it comes at the end because once you've made all the changes, you got to go back to that original account and you have to delete the data. You can't yeah. just leave it there. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's hard. I mean, it's really hard. Um, so this is an ongoing thing, but um, I, I, I would, my advice here is to not get into this position to begin with. Uh, make sure you're using the right accounts for the right things. And if you are trying to make this kind of a, a, a shift, like I am, Make a to-do list. Make sure you do it, you know, do it in order and take the time to do it right. It's, God, it's just such a pain it's, in the end. It's, so, a, it's effectively the same thing as taking a picture of the keyboard before you pry off the keycaps to clean yes. it. Yes. Because you will never, I, you yes. think you know the keyboard. You do not. <laughs> you do, uh, yes. That, that is an excellent example. I, one, of, one of the things I did uh, last weekend, I spent the, literally the entire weekend scanning photos It's the mm. and, and paper items and things. It was my last big scanning activity wow. i'm done i'm like I'm, I'm not saying there isn't more scanning to be done there's always more but i mean as far as stuff we knew that was just sitting there in a it's giant awesome. pot it's done good feeling yeah, it's awesome but then you have to edit it and crop it uh. and you know uh figure it out what date it goes to and and uh what you know put metadata on it it's it's, it's an awful awful process but was, one of the things i did do was if you picture like photo albums where you might have um descriptions of the pictures yeah. i did exactly i just i took pictures of those just so i when i organized Smart. them i would know the dates so what you, you have know, but yeah that's the keyboard thing it's exactly that so for people in the i don't know if microsoft has anything quite like this but in the google space for all of their problems especially privacy the one thing that google gets right is they have a takeout service that lets you download all of the data that you have in any or all of your google services right um it's at uh, accounts.google.com and is a direct, it might even be that slash takeout. But uh, if you have any data in Google, you should look at this like right now. <laughs> and that's true whether or not you're staying in Google. Maybe you use Google for a little while and you forgot about it or whatever. Uh, go look at this. Um, the thing I discovered, like I said, I had 470 uh, gigabytes of data in Google Photos. When I downloaded it, it was 550 gigabytes. And that's because there's a bunch of crap they put in there that I exercised out of there. But JSON files and all kinds of other stupid stuff. Um you probably have more data in there than you know. So whether or not you're moving, um, you know, between services like I am, maybe you're le leaving the Google ecosystem or something, uh, it doesn't matter. Definitely take a look at this because you will be shocked at how much stuff is there. And you can very easily, uh, you could also remove it if you want, right? Obviously you can uh, do that kind of stuff, but you might want to download some of that. So I, it's definitely worth looking at. Uh, obviously things like Google Photos are, you know, for, on a personal level are important because it's your photos. And I also discovered, by the way, that when I downloaded this and looked at it, it was not what I thought it was because I thought Google Photos was like the the best version of my photo uh, collection. I thought it was the most complete, and it is not. <laughs> so oh. uh, I now have work to do to integrate it with my other photo collections um, and make sure it's one big thing, and then I got to push it back up to Google. So fun. Um, anyway, Google Takeout is great, and uh, you should... Please look at it. And yeah, use Google in any way. Please. One do. thing, one of our sponsors, uh, Myleo Photos, which is a, kind of a photo access or photo management mm -hmm. tool, does direct input for takeout. So you download the takeout files. So you don't have to pro because takeout, if you look at them, it's a mess. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so they actually do. They will import it, and it uh, <laughs> solves a lot of problems. So take, oh, I take yes, a look I'm at sorry. that. I should say actually, I forgot something because I'm not using this service. Um, Takeout also uh, allows you to export some of it to other services. So in the case of photos, I don't remember the exact list. It's not to another Google Photos, which would have been nice. Um, it is uh, OneDrive. I know is one, and I think, I, I don't know, maybe not Amazon Photos, but may, maybe Amazon Photos. But it will actually let you export uh, to some cloud services as well directly, which is actually would be valuable. Yeah. So I'm sorry, what was the name of the... M-Y-L-I-O, and there's a free version you can... 
try for a single computer. I re I use it now, and one I'm of the sorry, things it does. Myo. 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 Like my and they are sponsors. I should disclaim that. Yeah. My Myo Leo, and uh, one of the things they also do is deduplication. So, like you, I have photos in a variety of different places, yes. and I wanted to consolidate it all and then dedupe. They do a good job of that yep. too. So this may be a tool that will help. That you. stuff is horrific. Oh, okay, I've it's used a nightmare. so many apps to yeah. try to figure this out. God, I gotta look at yep. this. All right, this yep. is good. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Good, good, good. Um there. that was your tip. Where are we? And my pick. And your pick. Yep, that was it. That was You want to pick anything? Uh, we're not gonna do um booze. <laughs> well, I was so, so he's gonna talk about um old fashions, old fashions next yeah. week. I will say, um it, even before I started uh down kind of a low carb, high fat diet, um I um was still really kind of doing a lot like mostly low carb for a long time. And I don't like I find things that are sweet to be like overly sweet. And so I, I, I don't mean like I invented, but my wife and I sort of invented a cocktail, which is, was a kind of a halfway point between a, um, an old fashioned and a Manhattan, which is, uh, you know, the, the big difference there is instead of having like a simple syrup of some kind for the sweetness in an old fashioned, you have a sweet vermouth, which is not very sweet despite the name and is, has a lot less sugar in it. Oh, um, clever. but maybe that's too dry for people. Clever. So I, in, in the beginning I was like, we'll mix those two things together. We'll have like half sugar, half vermouth, or we'll make, find some mix, and we'll call this thing an old Hatton, right? And uh, I think I might have mentioned, I might have <laughs> talked about Hatton. this in an earlier show like when Richie wasn't around. <laughs> but since then, I've actually switched fully to Manhattans because even even that I find to be too sweet. And of course, now I don't want sugar. So anyway, so um, a Manhattan, if you're on a like a low carb or keto diet or whatever, um, is uh, doesn't move the needle on your blood glucose Isn't at all. Good. Uh, which yep, hundred percent. I'm gonna start it's, drinking. Um, I mean, I listen. I between so what was the thing, joke? I should, um, I can't remember the joke. It was like um, I was going to call. Well, this is not exactly, but I was going to call it like the Manhattan diet because honestly, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's right there. It's right there. It's like the. It's right there. It's right. It's almost. If you there. don't care about liver health, I mean, yeah. honestly, there are other things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my friend, you have <laughs> you have carried this show mightily on the shoulders. Those broad ketogenic shoulders of yours and yes. now i shall release you from your labors because yeah, next we're driving week, right to new york are you to, uh, you travel right a lot york. now that the kids are gone you were in uh, dc and then <laughs> well no this is for the microsoft event so, oh, oh um, this is for that are yeah. you gonna bring stephanie yeah. I mean, though my and wife's have coming a good, and we're gonna yeah, we'll and... see mary joe while we're there oh, and nice. um that would be nice we'll go to eat and stuff but Very uh good. yeah we're gonna we have to get there early tomorrow so we're gonna go tonight it's an early start are you gonna stay at the yale club no, uh, we looked at, um, <laughs> I was just telling that story to someone. We were, we looked at uh, hotels in Manhattan, including the ones Microsoft reserved for us. And they are, oh my God, like 600 bucks it's a night. It's really outrageous. Um, so we're going to yeah. stay in Jersey City. Um, but uh, Everything's yeah, legal so in we'll Jersey, as they say in Hamilton. <laughs> my friend Paul Thurot is at Thurot.com, T-H-U-R-R-O-T-T.com. Go there tomorrow morning. Uh, is it 10 a.m. Eastern? What time is it? 10 a.m. is the actual start of the event. Okay, um, you'll be live blogging. will be blogging. broadcast at, yeah, well, 10 a.m. I'll be live blogging. Well, I hope so. I mean, I hope I don't get lost in it. But yeah, I'm gonna, my intention is to. Um, watch, we'll watch, watch Thurot.com for the deets. Uh, and then, of course, you'll be back next week, uh, next mm -hmm. Wednesday at 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC on live.twit.tv. That's where you can watch it live. You don't have to watch it live. You can download it on demand versions of the show at twit.tv slash WW. There's a YouTube channel dedicated to Windows Weekly. And of course, you can subscribe in your favorite podcast client and get it automatically. Richard will be back next week. Should be a lot of fun. There'll be a lot of you know more details about all of these topics yeah Very I, I think we're going to learn more too in yeah. the next week i mean not, not just like tomorrow's show but i think even some of the other stuff we're going to there's going to be more to learn uh so we'll see there's more to learn be here there's next week i will not mike Sargent will be filling in um as i said i'm going to wisconsin for a green bay game to celebrate our son's 21st birthday uh i pr imagine some manhattans will be consumed <laughs> Yeah, there you go. It goes good with any kind of cheese. It's nice. <laughs> well, that's that's all we got is cheese and brats. So I am think yeah, I'm ready. That's all. That's right. Thank you, Paul. Have a great week. We'll Thank see you. you next time on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye.
Hey, I'm Rod Pyle, Editor-in-Chief of Ad Astra Magazine, and each week I join with my co-host to bring you This Week in Space, the latest and greatest news from the final frontier. We talk to NASA chiefs, space scientists, engineers, educators, and artists, and sometimes we just shoot the breeze over what's hot and what's not in space, books, and TV. And we do it all for you, our fellow true believers. So whether you're an armchair adventurer or waiting for your turn to grab a slot in Elon's Mars rocket, join us on This Week in Space and be part of the greatest adventure of all time. <laughs> 